the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. Okay, members, you're all uh, very welcome to a meeting of the uh, Justice Committee. Uh, today we have a, a range of issues that we need to consider. We have an oral evidence session with the Chief Constable. Uh, there's further deliberations on the bill clauses. Uh, we have the Department of Justice main estimates, the annual review of the Secretary of State's direction powers, uh, proposed consultation on the development of Joint Secure and Justice Campus for Children on Woodlands Lake Land, or Lakewood site. Then there is a summary of responses to the consultation on the law on child exploitation, uh, sexual exploitation and the next steps. Then we have the Department's uh, draft corporate, corporate plan and business plan, and then the restarting the accreditation process for community-based restorative justice organisations and transfer of legislation. So we will get through today's business as efficiently as possible. Um, if members can do the needful with any of their electronic uh, devices, that would be appreciated. Uh, the informal deliberations on the provisions of the Domestic Abuse Bill will be recorded uh, by Hansard in the normal fashion and at this stage if members have any uh, interest, financial or otherwise, in respect of any business on today's meeting, now is the time to declare it. Well, then we will proceed. There is no apologies having been received. Um, Sinead Bradley is not here in this room but is planning to join us through the Starleaf Broadcasting uh, Mechanism. Uh, also, again, I know um, Mr Beatty for the second time in, in recent weeks has received another uh, threat from an illegal uh, paramilitary organisation, just to assure him, on behalf of the committee, of our support and condemnation of those in which this threat has emanated uh, from Doug. I know you will not be deterred from carrying you. out your important you, work. Uh, the draft minutes of the meeting that was held on the 17th of September. Uh, if members are content that the minutes are a true reflection of the proceedings, then I will sign them accordingly. Agreed? Uh, matters, matters arising. There are two items in the meeting pack. One in the one item in the tabled papers uh, that I just want to, to mention. Item one: domestic abuse family proceedings bill. The written evidence from an individual. Uh, there was one further written submission, uh, and that has been received. And it's there for members to note and can be drawn upon in our deliberations of the bill. Item two is the draft forward work program up to the first of October. Uh, the Department wishes to schedule an oral evidence session on the October monitoring round at the meeting on 1 October, along with a written briefing uh, on a proposed statutory rule to amend the Access NI filtering scheme. And it also uh, wanted to schedule a written briefing on a draft consultation on the Modern Slavery Strategy 2020-21, but has asked for that to be deferred to 8 October uh, to enable it to be presented with a briefing on the results of the consultation to minor changes of the 2015 Human Trafficking Act and proposed next steps. So, If members are content, uh, we will seek to schedule the items requested by the Department uh, for the meeting on the 1st of October, um, which, Christine, I am assuming we are moving back to two o'clock meetings from next week? Um, yes, it is at the end, so at, at the end of the business. Or it will have to be the, um, either the 1st of October from next week, yeah, preferably, or definitely the following week. Okay, so well, the, the working assumption is we'll be going to 2 o'clock from next week, unless we'll I be starting at two. I mean, previously we were starting at 1.30, so will it be starting at 2 or will it be starting earlier? The problem being if a committee is, is in a, ahead of us. I'm not sure. We, we can check, but my understanding is the morning committees have to be out by half one. And the afternoon committees start at two to allow the rooms to be cleaned. Okay. But I will check. I mean, no, if, no. if there's a facility to start at half one and the committee wants to, we can. But that's my understanding is that that those were the slots that were going to be used. Well, we'll pick it up later in the in, in, in the agenda on the on the meeting. But um, that's the assumption I had in terms of next week. But we can we can come back to that. Then the the final item uh, matters arising. Uh, police Service of Northern Ireland Retention and Disposal Scheme. The Committee considered the Police Service of Northern Ireland's Retention and Disposal Schedule at the meeting on 10 September. Members had raised no concerns with regard to the content of the schedule. Uh, however, it did request confirmation if the Policing Board had sight of the schedule and details of any comments or issues that were raised. The Policing Board has responded to advise that it has not had sight of the Retention and Disposal Schedule. Uh, the PSNI schedule will be included on the agenda for formal consideration by the committee on the 1st of October. However, the schedule is subject to the negative resolution procedure and the statutory period will end on the 5th of October. And while there's been no indication that the committee 
uh, wishes to pray against the schedule. If there is any reason the committee is likely to want to do so, the business committee uh, would need to be advised of a potential motion from the committee in advance of its meeting on the 29th of September. Uh, the Justice Committee would then need to inform the Business Committee whether it wishes to proceed or not with the motion following formal consideration on the 1st of October. So, members, I had to bring it in at this stage because of the negative resolution procedure and the time scales associated with it. Um, I have no intention of wanting to pray against this schedule. I am content with its content. Um, but we had sought that information, and the Police and Board uh, have come back to say that they're not, they have not been made aware of it. Okay, and have they any view of, of whether they should have been? Or? It has not been expressed. Mm. They just came back to give us the factual position that they, they had not had sight on it. So members are content um, that we are not going to be praying against this schedule. Sure, I think it would be useful for us to look at it though, in more detail. Well, we did. It is a very <laughs> complex document. A lot, there is a lot of information in it. Um, and it is an issue that has been in the media recently about the civil service and so on. About the well, this I item, this item was dealt with at a previous committee meeting yeah. when we considered it. We went through its content. It was just there was a member who had asked, had the policing board been given a view? So mm -hmm. the committee did, from my recollection, quite extensively debate this. Okay, so uh, item four then of the agenda uh, is the European Union exit and justice related issues and key policing priority challenges and the oral evidence. At, uh, session and it's for pages 12 to 71 of the meeting pack for the relevant papers and uh, the chief constable and his team are attending via the starleaf uh, facility and they're going to provide an overview briefing on the psni's eu exit and justice related issues <coughs> and key policing priorities and challenges and i know um, members had pulled together some other questions as well which we will get to in due course, and the committee provided that information in advance uh, to the chief constable. So, can I uh, formally welcome the chief constable of the Police Service of Northern Ireland, uh, Simon Brin, to the uh, meeting? The deputy chief constable, Mark Hamilton, uh, from the Community Safety uh, Department, and assistant chief uh, constable, Mark uh, McEwen, from the Police Service, as well, to the meeting. So, you're all very welcome. And again, this session will be recorded and reported by Hansard and published on the committee web page in due course. So if I can uh, invite the Chief Constable um, to provide a brief overview of the EU exit and justice related issues and other key policing priorities and challenges that he wishes to draw to the attention of the committee. Thank you, Simon. Well, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I will say a few words. Just to get the uh, record accurate, I am joined, as you say, by a, a small team. Um, from Brooklyn here today. Uh, Mark Hamilton is the Deputy Chief Constable and Mark McEwen is from the Community Safety Department. So between us, we'll, we'll do our best to uh, answer the breadth of issues that are important. I thought in terms of taking the opportunity just to bring the committee members up to speed with some of the headlines, which I know are of interest to you today and the general policing context. Um, I, I, there's a number of themes I thought it, was, it would be prudent to mention. I think, firstly, uh, it goes without saying we are policing in an unprecedented period since we were last before you as a committee. And I know perhaps as the day goes on, uh, there'll be more detail around how we police uh, the regulations, our relationships with the public, and indeed how we're keeping our own workforce going. One of the things I've been particularly impressed with, though, is the way we responded in the early days of this health crisis organisationally. We did collapse the organisation very quickly to put extra officers on the streets. And at the same time, we've now issued nearly 3,000 laptops as part of what was planned modernization, but came sort of quite fortuitous to enable us to effectively put one in three of people working in the back office, which keep the place ticking over in that agile working space. And I think that's been really effective. Um, having been out a lot myself throughout the COVID period, I, and I know clearly this will be an issue for every one of you in your own community, I, I think it's worth also praising the resilience and the commitment of officers and staff during this crisis. Some people I will always single out are those officers that actually staff what we call the COVID crews, which are specialist teams in each policing district, which are at the vanguard of our response to any incident where we think a victim or a witness or indeed a suspect is suffering from the, uh, from the illness. And they're putting themselves at additional risk. And I think I'd like to praise them. 
Um, in terms of the effect on policing, we can go into the detail later, but broadly speaking, we have dealt with over 12,000 COVID-related calls in this period uh, and 1,500 interventions, which include things like prohibition notices, which have been more to the fore recently, and fixed penalty notices. In the coming days, as the regulations and guidance changes, our operational presence will, will be visible in communities right across the country and will have particularly emphasis on policing house parties and actually the change in emphasis on the licensing arena because of the new regulations where we will step back more into joint inspections with uh, other designated agencies than the stance we've taken recently. And clearly we'll be um, wanting to be visible in crowded spaces to encourage social distancing. Um, policing has not happened in a vacuum, as you know, and it's amazing to think in the summer months just all the issues we've had to deal with as an organisation and how this has affected the community, but also we've adapted. So it's included, as you know, praise, the policing of bonfires, the Black Lives Matter protest, the policing of funerals, and now indeed in recent days, how we police uh, sporting events, which we may come back to later. The difference for us in terms of the policing challenge and complexity is that we are now having to police general work that you'd expect us to do, as well as the health crisis. And just to give you some sense of this, our 999 calls are now pretty much at the rates they were pre-COVID, but we're now having to deal with a rise in the virus. Antisocial behaviour has gone up a lot, frankly, uh, and crime levels are creeping back to the levels that we saw prior to the virus hitting the country. So we're having to manage a lot of issues, which is stretching resources. It's easy to forget that we're under pressure, but also we've been bucking the trend. So for example, um, in a general operational sense, drug seizures are up, weapon seizures are up, and we're doing more about investigating harassment, which I think is positive. And indeed, the number of people we're charging is up on a five-year average, and actually 10.5% higher than you'd see in an equivalent organization in England and Wales. Clearly, recent news has focused on the complexity of continuing to deal with organised crime and terrorism. I can't comment too much on the significant investigation into the new IRA, where 10 people have been charged, but also would highlight some of the increasing cooperative work we've had with the National Crime Agency, as well as efforts here, which, for example, have seen 70 searches and 179 charges in relation to Operation Veneti a UK-wide operation dealing with criminals that try to use encrypted phones. And indeed, I know it's an issue of concern to, to many people, and was referenced in your introduction, Chair, um, about the continuing pressure we're bringing to bear on paramilitary crime groups. And we've uh, conducted over 50 searches in the last few months. Behind the scenes, though, and it touches on things last time, the mission moves on. So I'm working hard with the Department of Finance to see how we can look at different models to release us from the current estate that we're in, which is tired and old, and look at a new headquarters for the service over the next few years. And actually, and I think it is really important, particularly in the context of Brexit and COVID, that we continue to invest into neighbourhood policing. We're nearly at the threshold of 400 officers, which we promised a year ago, um, and the style is starting to change with increasingly seeing people on foot on bicycles and problem solving in communities, and we may come back to that. More recently, because people say you never see the police, we've increased the visibility of the fleet. Big issues which I'll touch on today, but I'll just give passing reference before detailed questions, Chair, is we continue to deal with issues of legacy which are unresolved, despite the hurt families of, of people that have been victims of, of the troubles feel, and we await clarity about what the new proposals from the government are. But as a key giveaway, I think, from my appearance before the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, we sit on 95 tonnes of evidence. So this is a significant issue and just the breadth and the detail of bringing justice, if that's a resolution, or indeed bringing information to victims, just to give you some sense of it. Clearly, Brexit is one of the headline issues that you want to talk about today. It's fast moving. We are cooperating well across other parts of the policing network in the UK as well as into, uh, in, into the Garda corner and the rest of, of Europe. Um, I don't think the prospect may be as gloomy as some people might think. Clearly, Mark, particularly today, will be able to update on some of the justice and safety issues and how we operationalise any protocol that's finalised uh, following the 1st of January. The one thing I would highlight to you, whilst the Department of Justice are working closely with us, that we do have a funding pressure 
that's immediate in terms of a 4.5 million gap to actually balance the books for the uh, commitment to fund officers to police the Brexit challenge. And obviously, as we don't quite know what it's going to look like, nearly 200 of those neighbourhood officers I talked about are actually supported through Brexit funding. And Mark will probably touch on later how we see them playing a crucial role, particularly in the border areas, to bring normality to communities if we go through change. A lot's happened in the criminal justice space because of COVID, but we're working hard to retain confidence in the system with the Lord Chief Justice, with the, with the Prosecution Service and the courts to try and address backlogs as well as harness the effects of new technology to speed up justice. Also, we continue to plan for the long term and are keen to see how it will, the financing envelope that we're giving as an organisation may change in the next few years to help that long term planning. And perhaps the committee might wish to consider whether we'll see any of the benefits announced in England and Wales for £60 million to policing and to designated bodies to police the effects of COVID and whether you want to see that replicated here. Finally, uh, in terms of um, what's been happening, it's not just trying to project what's, what's been behind us and what's prospective challenge, but some results. So in the broader sense, we have a new community safety strategy and that will be, uh, and sorry, a new community safety board uh, which I think we're seeing working increasingly effectively, which Mark may be able to touch on, on later as we bring partners to the table to address some of the long-term and more enduring issues. And a new crime prevention strategy where we see prevention and problem solving at the heart of our policing office of the public of Northern Ireland. There is more to do. We learned a lot of lessons from the summer over the policing of bonfires and how we brought people to bear to share the responsibility for dealing with some of these complex issues. And clearly the Holy Lands reminds us that actually there are problems that go beyond policing. In the last few days, we've issued over, well, we've issued actually 40 fixed penalty notices since Tuesday and 12 prohibition notices in the Holy Lands area. So it continues to be a, a policing concern, but I think the resolution isn't a policing one. So I would call for your support in getting more people to the table to deal with long-term issues, such as housing policy, licensing, and the regulation of all of this rather than really relying on the police to pick up the tab at the end. Um, in terms of uh, other issues I think you may find interesting today, that our clearance rates for crime remain stable to type, despite the pressures of, of, of COVID. Um, recruitment into the organisation continues, particularly on the police officer campaign we were talking about when we last saw you. And equally, uh, we've been doing work behind the scenes to make sure we're on our front foot for the next phase of COVID, and I've just completed a joint review with the guards to look at lessons learned from all the effort we undertook in sort of March to, to the midsummer. And we want to make sure we bring that, that learning to fore in early challenges over the next few months. But uh, I think I've said enough in that introduction, Chair, if that's useful to you. And I'll, I'll open it to, uh, to members for questions of the three of us. OK, thank you, Chief Constable. And, and that's very much appreciated. And let me join with you in commending the work of um, your officers and how they've been going about their duties over the past number of months, given the environment that we face. And you've highlighted the increased number of drug seizures, weapon seizures, uh, making our, safe, uh, our streets safer. And uh, in particular, I know uh, a lot of praise that I've heard from people around the operation to deal with the uh, new IRA, notwithstanding the live investigations. But I just want to put on record uh, my uh, congratulations in uh, what you've been able to do in respect of that operation. Um, we're going to just pick up some themes uh, rather than have members jump in and out. So uh, if we can break it down, we'll, we'll cover the EU exit issues first, and then we're going to cover COVID issues. Some of this may interlink with then uh, some of the questions members have raised around you know, police resources and staffing levels. Um, and then we'll move into just some other other issues that have been raised. So, on the on the European Union exit issues, what what has been the the kind of planning taking place for the resources that we've been would be needed in the scenario where there isn't a, a negotiated uh, arrangement, and have those bids been submitted, and is there indications that they would be met? Well, I think it's two parts to that uh, question, Chair, and, and I can bring Mark uh, McEwen in as well if you want. But firstly, in terms of planning, uh, it relates 
in, in the first instance, to, to Mark. He's, he's now here in police speak as uh, what we call our goal commander. So in other words, the senior officer that I would appoint to look at all matters Brexit, both in terms of developing our strategy as well as monitoring the operational response, which, as you say, we will come to sooner than we, when we, when we may think. Um, we have done a, a lot of scenario planning in the past, which we are refreshing because the environment is, is fast moving. We have uh, been in, in conversation with the Department of Justice in particular, firstly to close the gap in the bid for the 300 plus officers and staff that we need this year to police the agreed challenges of, of COVID. And obviously, as we project forward into next year's financial plan, uh, are in dialogue with the Department of Justice as well to see as we get clarity in terms of the policing challenges, what additional resource we may need. But um, you will be aware that there's a, there's a, if you like, there's a people issue to make sure that we've got enough officers and staff to protect the public in any new environment. But there's also a lot of work going on behind the scenes uh, with UK colleagues, uh, with the Garda Shikorna, and actually with other sort of key people, for example, the border force that we deal with to make sure we're on the front foot. And there, there, I know there's historically some concern, for example, about the justice and home affairs issues around legislation. Um, in the absence of a deal chair, I think it's important to sort of set a tone that whilst some of the resolutions that we are seeing and hearing about may be suboptimal, I think there's increasing confidence there will be workarounds if we have to go to that space, if we can't develop an efficient security partnership uh, by the 1st of January. So that that work is going on behind the scenes every day. Uh, but if there are specifics in terms of the, the effects, uh, we can obviously take those questions. But whether it's the, the exchange of information through the uh, Schengen information system, where that's used over 500 million times a year across Europe to check whether people are wanted or missing, for example, whether it's European arrest warrants, joint investigation teams, um, things may be slower. There may be delays, which are frustrating for everybody in, in, two, in, in 2021. But I think there is commitment to see that we make it as effective as possible. And you have to put a balance that against the volumes in terms of what we actually use these, these systems and these processes for here. But we can provide more detail if you want, Chair. Is there any specifics around uh, officers being assigned to do with community policing, supporting border force that relates to the Brexit side of the planning? Yes, we, I, I'm meeting the head of border force every month uh, to look at some of the, the immediate issues. Uh, but let me bring uh, Mark McEwen in, who's doing a lot of work at the moment to, um, to see the effects of Brexit and how we police not just the ports, but particularly the, the, the border area. So thank you, Chair. Um, if, I, if I outline broadly, the, the approach here is, is almost two phases in terms of EU exit. So we have scenario planning and plans in place working with partners, including Border Force, around what we may see in the early part. So you know, the, the, the beginning of January here, the new compliance measures that, that may be in place and what that means, whether or not that will cause some disruption um, some small levels of protest or those those types of scenarios we have been planning with our partners um, to ensure that we have the right resources in the right place to deal with that uh, and to assist the community and, and minimize disruption uh, and that goes so far as to, to plan along with with other police services uh, in GB in, in Scotland and Merseyside uh, and places like that um, if we consider then the somewhat longer term uh, impact that, that the EU exit may have, we know already there is considerable uncertainty and concern in many of the parts of the community, particularly in border areas. Um, there are concerns around the fact that some of those communities, particularly in the agri-food sector, uh, may be disproportionately economically impacted. Um, and that brings with it its own challenges in, in areas where that, that uh, way of life is already challenging. And so we, we are working with partners to look at what does our community policing footprint look like? Um, what more can we do uh, to, to support those communities? And what does that mean in terms of, of supporting our partners here, whether that's border force, um, health and social care, or, 
or any of the people we, we would work with ordinarily to provide a policing service. As the Chief has outlined, particularly when we think about the Justice and Home Affairs um, instruments that we have, we have been very vocal, um, as have other services, uh, in influencing um, the, the fact that we have communities that move across the, the border between um, ourselves um, uh, on a daily basis. And that has been listened to and is very much being taken into account in, in dealing with those matters. Okay, thank you. I know, Doug, you had asked for yeah, some I, questions in this, this area. I can. Um, uh, thank you, Chief Constable and, and Mark Squared. Um, but can I just ask you a question? It's, uh, it, it wasn't on the list, but, but it's something that came up from the uh, executive committee that I was sat on yesterday, uh, and that is some parties within the um, within the executive thinks we are hurtling towards a non-negotiated outcome, and yet there is no executive-led cross-departmental working group to look at the non-negotiated outcome. So, therefore, could I ask you? Uh, are you working, and at what level are you working with the likes of the Department for Infrastructure or the Department for Communities um, or DERA in regards to um, a non-negotiated outcome, or are we all working in silos here at the moment? No, uh, we are working very closely with um, through our, our partners in the Department for Justice. Um, and that spans right across to DERA, Department for Infrastructure, to see what this would look like. Um, as the Chief mentioned uh, at the sort of start of this conversation, uh, a non-negotiated outcome um, still means that we are working very closely with uh, the negotiations around particularly justice and home affairs issues. Setting aside the, the, the broader negotiations, there is a strong will from both the UK and the EU in terms of those instruments. So from a, a justice and a policing perspective, um, we are still playing a, a, a very strong role in those negotiations. We work with uh, the UK wide um, uh, negotiating bodies, um, the International Crime Coordination Centre, the National Police Chiefs Council, in that ourselves in Scotland um, have a seat at that table and are able to influence that and as I as I mentioned earlier articulate our own particular concerns around that um, and whilst we look at then what the compliance uh, infrastructure may be and the processes may be we are scenario planning around that it is our assessment that even in the non-negotiated outcome we won't see a huge impact in the in the immediate aftermath in the early stages of, of January, but we're working very closely with with Border Agency, with DERA and others to ensure that we understand fully what those compliance uh, measures may mean, what that might mean for, mean for the road network, and we're uh, liaising with uh, associations such as the Holliers Association and and other people who are uh, within our community who who may be affected by this. Mark, thanks, thanks for that. But, but I get the sense um, that you, uh, as a force, are reaching out to these organisations. But I don't get the sense that somebody is garnering them all together with you as key stakeholders to, to, to create that, that overall sort of um, joined up piece. I, and I'll give you an example. If you remember before Brexit, and I know this assembly wasn't sitting at the time, but before Brexit, we had a step up ops rooms in every single department. Um, to deal with a no Brexit scenario, uh, and I know there's a paper floating about about stepping up these ops rooms again in a non-negotiated um, outcome. But I have a real concern that you, uh, as a force, are reaching out, but I just do not see where we have got all our departments together, including yourselves, with justice, to to make sure that we are prepared. Uh, and I have, a, I have a genuine concern uh, about that. Do you have any concern that this is joined up or not um, at, a, at a higher level and not just at a police level? I think we can always do more in terms of trying to coordinate and, and provide a, a coherent uh, strategy, one that serves our communities and the people who are going to be affected by this. Um, we do have, as I say, we have very good working relationships with uh, the various departments and with Angarda Shikona. Um, 
but I, I, I take the member's point and, and we can always do more than that and it's, it's something that we, we, can, we can help to, to raise. Mark, thank you. And, and I don't think it's just you can do more. By the, by the way, that's not a finger pointing at the, at the police. I'm, I'm talking about the, the wider piece, but thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Emma, then Linda, and then Sinead Bradley. And if members can put the questions as succinctly as possible. So, Emma. Thanks, Chair. Um, my question is around the... Um, in May 2018, there was a list of um, PSNI stations that were taken off the market, one of them being in my own constituency of South Down, Warren Point, which is a border community which we were talking about. Um, that was obviously New Morning Down Council had plans to buy that station as a community hall for the for the local community group, um, and it was it was taken off the market due to the uncertainty of Brexit. Um, can you give me an idea of what the plans are in place for that site uh, and the other sites that you have at the minute, and, and where we're at with that? Do you want me to? I think I think the issue there, and might might come in on, on specifics, but we're actually looking at a number of decisions we made in 2018 to see are there opportunities to sort of uh, go back into some of these buildings in the short term, um, but actually not do it, do it as, as, as us in isolation and seeing where in places like you mentioned at Warren Point, we might be able to use them in a different way because going back to uh, Doug's previous question about joining up, um, we're, we're really committed to try and look at a, a different arrangement for policing and community safety in the medium term so that rather than just seeing it as a police station we see it as a, a community safety base because there could be other partners that we would want to have dialogue and contact with and we're, we're encouraging uh, that approach from uh, local local district councils uh, as well as other people that would want to support us in managing any transition and i think it goes back to the, the previous point really if you reflect over the summer um, you know, we have worked hard with other partners to bring them to the table, uh, as Doug was saying, in terms of the Community Safety Board, the response to bonfires. But we, I've been, you know, a year ago, I called for a Community Safety Board for Northern Ireland that had, had more punch power. And, and really, we could do with something like that to join the dots up, in my view. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Linda? Thank you. Um, for your responses so far, just in relation to any discussions that you've had with the Gardaí regarding um, the continuing cross-border cooperation in the event of a no agreement end to the transitional period, and what difficulties or what challenges you might have in that event? So we, we do have, as I mentioned earlier, we have very strong relationships um, with Angarda Shikana. Um, there have been, as uh, the committee will understand, certain uh, issues around clarity and issues, some political sensitivities about direct negotiation around um, uh, our, our ongoing uh, transfer of information and, and other matters uh, within the Justice and Home Affairs uh, side of things. Um, as we have come towards the, the, the EU exit date, those um, negotiations and conversations uh, rather than negotiations have stepped up. Um, we have very strong relationships. As I, as I mentioned earlier on, all of our uh, negotiations around those instruments are done through the UK wide negotiating, but we are able to influence that. We also have our own standalone service here um, looking at matters of information exchange, um, currently the European arrest warrants and extradition matters and things of that nature. So whilst there may well be a, a, a GB or an England and Wales body formed for that, we will retain our own standalone system but be embedded within that. And that's the way those negotiations have been going forward. That allows us to maintain those very strong relationships with uh, Angarda Shikona. Um, the DOJ have been liaising strongly with DOJE, and, and that as well allows us to, to progress that. So that has given us some reassurance that um, whilst the arrangements that we talked about may be suboptimal, we will still have those strong relationships and still continue our, our cooperative working. Just on the back of that, Chair, are there any GDPR issues, even in terms of the, the very basics of sharing information? So, for example, somebody is, is heading towards the, the border to, to try and evade being 
caught by the PSNA and, and, and the Go South. Are there any GDPR issues around that? Even around the very mm. basics of sharing information? Yeah. Yes, Chair. Uh, th those, are, those are all uh, sort of GDPR issues are being taken into account in terms of as we, as we negotiate to replace the, the current mechanisms with something equally as strong. Um, there are, there are uh, of course, issues around data adequacy and, and those things that we are working through at the moment. Um, but we are confident that because of the relationships we have, and as I say, we have been, we've made a very strong case through the UK-wide negotiating structures that actually a lot of the information sharing that we do, and it, it, it's true of many other services as well, but they are about missing persons, they're about lower level as they would be seen in, in the broader justice scheme um, issues. And, and we have, the, those are the things that affect the daily lives of our communities who live along the border areas. So we've, we've been very strong in that and we expect that we will get a reasonable outcome uh, and continue to work towards uh, replacing what we have now. Thank you. Sinead Bradley. Yeah, Emma's question there about the Warren Point police station. Um, I was the member who approached the PSNI asking them to bring that particular site uh, onto the disposal list, and Yuri Moran Council did talk to us at that time about the possibility of fine. But the conversation regarding the community centre has moved on. That said, I'm a little bit surprised at your comments saying um, about a community safe space. It may well still be the case that it would be helpful that the community had a space and then the PSNI could link into the community via that space rather than necessarily owning it. But um, I would like to look, I suppose I'm trying to understand the level of conversation that is being held at the moment regarding operational matters that will follow the Brexit. So for example, and I'm, I'm just gonna hone in on one because I know it is a particularly complicated and controversial one, is the European arrest warrants. So for example, you know, we talk about a suboptimal outcome and that there are negotiations trying to reach a system that is as strong as the European arrest warrant, although I've yet to hear what that is, but can you advise me what conversation is being held and at what level to discuss the actual detail? So, for example, one of the suboptimal options were the Norway-Iceland model. But when I look at it, that model references not just residency, but also nationality. So there's a minefield there in terms of honouring the Good Friday Agreement while trying to operationally run a model that is based on nationality as well as residency. And does the, the, have the PSNI foreseen problems with that? And if they have, who are they bringing those problems to? And I've heard a few times reference saying that you do feel listened to and that you do feel you're being heard. If you could walk me through that, that one operational piece, the effect it will have, who you're talking to, what you're telling them, and why you feel reassured that they're listening. Thank you, Chair. Oh. <clears throat> Thank you, Sinead. Thanks, thanks Chair. If, 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 you if you take a, 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 sort of, um, a, a sort of spring to some of you on this, because obviously whilst... Um, a lot of the sort of attention in the public spaces have been around COVID. Um, Brexit has still been fizzing along behind the scenes and obviously has now come more to the fore in recent weeks. So um, the start of some of this relationship, frankly, was um, opportunities some, some months ago now for me, for example, at one level to personally brief the Prime Minister about some of the issues and risks as we saw them in a strategic sense. and. Um, Whilst that, that briefing has some bounds of sensitivity, which, which I can't breach, that we were convinced that our message was heard. And then I know sometimes we don't want to hide behind somewhat opaque bureaucracy because, you know, policing is good at jargon and sort of uh, shorthand on acronyms for things. But the, there is there are working groups, for example, across National Police Chiefs Council, which link into Europe, which then will touch back into, into the Republic. As Mark said, um, 
we have operational dialogue uh, with the people actually wrestling with some of the policing issues, broadly at superintendent level, that uh, work, for example, to Mark, and then his equivalent in, in, in the Republic. The International Crime Coordination Centre, which Mark referenced, is important as a clearinghouse, and we have people seconded there to deal with some of the sort of granularity of what does this mean and what does it look like. So, for example, um, wrap around uh, alternatives to the arrest warrant do rely on the 1957 convention or do rely on what are called Interpol red notices. And they then have some detail behind them as to whether you can arrest or not, because before you can respond to a red notice, you also have to make sure someone's been circulated as wanted on warrant effectively in either here or in another country in a, in a different jurisdiction. So that there are things that, 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 that we are working at, uh, around and, uh, and that, that dialogue is, is quite detailed. Clearly, the anxiety you have and we have is we are still three months out from a finish line. All that we do know is that that finish line is coming quickly and there is lots of detail to, to tidy up. Um, but it's something that now we have uh, fresh eyes, frankly, because Mark's been brought in to look at this with a new chief superintendent that we've promoted to make sure that we've retested old plans, we're passed into the Home Office, we're passed into the Department of Justice, who, as Mark said, are also working in all sorts of different ways with different governments, that we, are, we, are, we feel confident if there's a, an operational imperative that pops up that we can address it. And just taking you back to the earlier comments you made about Warren Point, we're agnostic about what the answer looks like. We just want to see increasingly our police stations be more accessible. Uh, and actually, if the answer is it's a community hub, in which we have a space, well, that's something we can we can talk about locally because probably over the next two to three years, those are the sorts of conversations we want to have in a number of communities about how we change the look and feel of our police estate. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I wonder if, uh, th thank you, Chief Constable, I wonder if Mark would um, elaborate on that, you know, a little bit further in terms of um, would the model that may necessarily fit for other policing partners across the UK, is there a recognition that there is a different set of circumstances here in Northern Ireland based not just on the land border, but the nationality question that can be weaved through these agreements if they should be used? Yes, uh, Sinead, and um, there, there is recognition of that. There's recognition around the sensitivities here in terms of the Good Friday Agreement and the issues of residency versus nationality. And we have flagged those up and they are being taken into account. Um, they are, I suppose, unique to here in the fact that we do have a land border, but they are uh, issues that do exist elsewhere uh, as well um, uh, across uh, the, the UK and Ireland. So. Um, whilst they are recognised as being particular to us, there's something that is being wrestled with as part of those wider negotiations. Right, Chair, could I just ask, um, just finally, could you throw some light on what type of resolutions are being considered? Because it's a big, big challenge. You know, the land border may be a shared issue, but the, the nationality issue um, and the rights under the Good Friday Agreement are not so perhaps well known. Um, are understood. So I'd like to know what how, what are the conversations, how, how is that looking? Well, I, I think the key thing there, Sinead, is, is trying to work out respecting the, um, the policing space in terms of operational advice and how we're pushing up into government, both you know here and, and, the, and the Republic. And I think some of those answers about preserving the Good Friday Agreement are, are, are matters for ministers as much as, as, for, as for senior police officers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the the resolution of that particular problem, and uh, quite rightly, you, 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 you raise something as sensitive as that. But we're here, in that sense, we're here to advise the politicians rather than set policy. And clearly, there are still three months for <laughs> those sort of issues to, to be resolved. But certainly, um, I think, you know, speak for Mark, but we're confident that if there are concerns, there are mechanisms to raise them quick time at the moment. And clearly, as the clock starts ticking, uh, we're going to scenario test over the next three months, increasing ranges of options, because you imagine this is a complex issue. Uh, and if, if, if that throws up issues either for us or colleagues uh, in, in the Gardish corner, well, we won't be shy to bring them forward.
move on to COVID-19 and Gordon's going to be the first question on that area. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your responses so far. Mine are two very brief um, questions. In terms of, you would mentioned earlier on about 4.5 million um, in terms of budgetary pressures. Is that in general or is that an outstanding bid from the PSNI to DOJ relating to Brexit? Um, that's a specific bid in relation to Brexit. It's, um, we, we, are, we, have, we will be submitting that pressure in, in October. Um, but it, it relates solely to, to that issue. I think the broader question, um, because there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat here, isn't there, is we're still keen on dialogue with the government in relation to the commitment to grow us to 7,500 officers because, obviously, putting Brexit aside, we, we actually police the streets with discrete different funding streams that all add up to the totals of roughly 7,000 officers that we've got at the moment. So in the short term, there's a pressure of, of four and a half million. The, the previous settlement en enables to recruit 308 officer and staff posts. So clearly, if that funding dried up, it's not the sort of amount of money we can just absorb overnight by efficiency savings. And it would, would probably affect recruitment into 2021 and obviously officer numbers and staff numbers. Lastly, just in 2018, the previous Chief Constable outlined security concerns that he had over Brexit. Do you still share these concerns in the current context? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, I'm glad you've raised that because the bit we haven't sort of touched on this morning is that, um, you know, that there are some very important issues that, that, that affect the whole of Ireland and, and indeed beyond that, aren't there? But I think we, we can assume, and we're doing close work with the National Crime Agency, who have con conducted their own analysis, which we're patched into, that basically will say, as you know from perhaps the experience of many years, that criminals will exploit any gaps in sort of opportunities to, to raise money because that's the motivation at the end of the day. So differences in tariffs, differences in, in the common tariff area, the movement of people, we, we are alert, alert to that could all be exploited. So, for example, if you look at recent events over the summer, where we have focused more effort on the haulage industry, we are proposing to invest in the next few months different, different operational teams to see if we can scale up in relation to policing of uh, haulage. And equally, uh, we're going to increase the policing of the road network, for example, through the new AMPR intercept team to make sure that we learn some of the lessons of the last 12 months and where we can, we use intelligence to intercept, interdict and put criminals on the back foot. Similarly, um, despite the comments earlier around the arrest in relation to the new IRA, we're alive to the fact that there are still a small number of people that are influenced by a very poisonous and, and violent ideology, and that the, that the Brexit narrative could fuel that depending on how it finally ends, and we're keeping a close eye on that with our security partners. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to move on to the COVID-19 issues, Chief Constable, and a number of members had put questions forward, Rachel, Gordon, Doug and myself. And I'm going to bring those members in first and then I'll open it up to others. So, Gordon, um, two of the questions he was touching on was around advice to families in the organisation of funerals and then issues around uh, enforcement of regulations and prohibition notices. So, Gordon, can I bring you in yeah. at this stage for you to put your questions? Yeah, thanks, Chief Constable and your senior officers for joining us today. We do appreciate your time and your efforts. And again, I would emphasise the, the good work that has been done, certainly within our constituency in relation to neighbourhood policing. I suppose, first of all, on the COVID thing, I'm fully aware that a lot of our neighbourhood people were taken on COVID uh, duties, and more recently, you've tended to move away from that. Will we see a bit of a reversal again, then, in relation to our neighbourhood policing? Are we going to lose some of those resources again for COVID? as I would uh, assume that those uh, resources will be needed to be stepped up to, to I suppose, encourage and enforce the regulations? Um, again, that's a good question, and thank you. Well, firstly, um, there's, there's a few bits there that, to, to answer it and then come back, if you like, is touching neighbourhood policing will be a, a pool of officers of last resort for us. Now, clearly, we're as concerned as anyone else about the health prospects over the next few months. Um, but, but if you compare where we were in the spring to where we are now, um, there are more bodies designated for, with enforcement powers. So, providing they step up and start to use them, um, 
that is a, is a method of taking some pressure off frontline policing. Um, when we collapsed the organisation that I talked about at the start, that was to deal with a scenario where we could foresee perhaps a third of the workforce being absent for various reasons, and also high numbers of, of, of mortality sadly in the community. Now, despite the current health risks, we, we don't see that at the moment. So I've been very clear in relation to my, my relationship with our other goal commander, Alan Todd, who's done some superb work over the last six months, that neighbourhood policing is, is the end piece of any sort of uh, collapse of resources to support COVID policing. The other issue I think is important is that neighbourhood policing didn't entirely stop. And I saw firsthand, despite the fact that they were rostered to the 12 hour shifts to police the public space, officers continuing to visit victims of crime, uh, continuing, for example, I went to a, a food bank in Belfast twice where the, 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 the neighbourhood officers there were very much hardwired in, into that response to people of need. So, but we recognise, particularly from the review that we did with Garda Shikorna, that how important it was to keep a community or neighbourhood policing footprint, and that will be important for us going forward. So that I would give you that reassurance that how seriously we take the investment in neighbourhood policing, the importance of distractions from it, and, and to keep our promise to communities. Okay. The other point then is in relation to funerals. Uh, I suppose it, an issue that I've raised before with, with yourselves in May. Um, I suppose I'm, I'm thinking more about family funerals and how the ability of the public or friends, relatives to attend those funerals. I still feel that there needs to be some further clarification on that, on that issue. And I would appreciate your comments on that. Um, the funerals are highly sensitive. Uh, they're highly respected and still within our communities. And people respect death. And I, I think it's a very good thing in relation to, to building communities and, and showing respect for those uh, relatives and, and neighbours, as we, we like to do. But there's still a, a great uh, fear almost within people. You know, the people are unclear whether they can attend the funeral or not. So I would like some um, comments, I suppose, on that. My understanding is that within churches, funerals can take place, provided there's social distancing. Outside the church, people are not sure where they can stand. Um, outside, obviously, respecting social distance. Some people have a fear of almost getting arrested going to a funeral. And the other point is just about walking in a cortege. Is that acceptable, provided people social distance? And are the police willing to do traffic duty, etc., in a local community where it is required uh, during a funeral? Well, th th these are clearly uh, very uh, sensitive and, and emotive issues. But I, I, th I think something like setting a blanket policy on traffic duty in a local community is, in a nice way, is respecting the, the purpose here, Chair, is, is more a matter to be dealt with locally by the local district commander if there's a particular need not to set blanket policy here. Um, similarly, the, uh, again, the, the, the application of regulations and their interpretation are frankly a matter for the, for the health minister and the team that supports him. Uh, there is a raft of guidance online for people to sort of try and help them make choices. Uh, you referenced yourself that the regulations that they currently apply to churches and the numbers of people that can actually gather outside I think if there's any reassurance to communities, we've said from the outset um, that we, we, we adopt this four E's approach, which I think is pretty well understood with people now. So that the last E enforcement is, is a last resort. So if we, if we see there are issues, then we would probably want a conversation with people and encourage them to adapt their behavior in terms of social distancing, respecting how difficult an issue this is. And it's actually an approach that we, we took largely over the over the summer months, but um, I, I think it's probably um, that's a matter for, for 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 ministers to resolve in terms of clarification. I think that you know the police uh, advice or instruction on it is is useful, and people see yourselves as being the authority at the end of the day on on whether how people behave within the street or how they can assemble. And I think there's still that. Fear and, and, and worry from, from the good general public out there, the law-abiding citizens of this country who generally um, do
do attend such funerals and that they are unable to do. And it's still, there's still something very prohibitive and sounds prohibitive about it. But I think you, you know, give us some assurance that, that within reason it, it can take place, but um, and the police will, I suppose, locally you're leaving it locally with, with commanders and so on, whether they will get involved in, in assisting funerals. Would that be fair? Well, the, the, the local policing of any community, from a, whether it's a town or a small village, is a matter for either the, the, the district commander or, or the teams that work there. So, I, again, I, I wouldn't want to set policy. I think one of our successes over the last six months has been the use of discretion and that, that band of, of, of you know three to four E's. Yeah. But I, I do have to stress, and I point you to the comments made, I think, yesterday uh, by, by the health minister about the place of policing in the COVID regulations. Uh, we are here to enforce regulations that are set by the health minister. Uh, we also have a raft of other responsibilities on a day-to-day -day basis, as I said at the start. So I wouldn't really want to get drawn into the, the, the fine detail of how a particular funeral should be policed and just encourage people to follow the guidance. Another point, Chair, just quickly on COVID. I, I'm a member of the Economy Committee, and yesterday there was considerable debate about wearing of masks within supermarkets and shops. Do you feel the police could ultimately have a role there in encouraging, monitoring, I think would be good words, um, in relation to encouraging the public to up the, uh, the wearing of masks? And um, it is an, a factor where people, the majority of people are wearing them, but there's a number of people are not. And, and can you do more to, to help in relation to see that there's proper compliance within the, say the retail sector. I, I appreciate you do work with all the various organisations, uh, chambers of trade and, and local representatives, but I do feel, and the point I think is coming, where we're going to need some stronger action from the police, if required, in relation to the wearing of masks. Well, again, you know, masks are, are, are a key part of, of keeping us all safe in, in appropriate circumstances. Obviously, particularly in enclosed spaces and on public transport, so that uh, we're, we're here really to support other designated bodies and other people because, for example, through the Gold Commander, as you say, there is active dialogue with Retail and I. Um, we've had conversations this week with TransLink, who, for example, report high levels of compliance with the public wearing face masks on public transport. Um, and I, I would remind the whole committee, really, that you know, we, we have to balance uh, where we put precious resources so that and, and and remembering as well that in some instances people will assert they have particular reasons within the regulations and guidance for not wearing a mask but we we are here to support other people in that process rather than be on the front foot frankly because as i said at the start we're now dealing with 999 calls that are back to normal levels we're dealing with more antisocial behavior and crime is creeping up so that we have a, a broad range of responsibilities to protect the public and keep communities safe. And clearly, encouragement by, by shop owners and retailers is as much part of the answer than the police stepping to the, into this space where, we're, you know, where other people have shared responsibility. And again, I point you to the comments made yesterday by the Health Minister. OK, thanks very much. Thank Chief you, Gordon. Thanks, Chair. Just a couple of quick kind of fa factual questions I would like to, to get some clarity on. Um, 12,000 COVID calls, um, Chief Constable, you mentioned at the start. Just in a, in a general sense, can you break that down as to what, what are the nature of those calls? What are people asking and reporting? Well, firstly, um, the, 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 the calls are coming in, in two ways, through 101 and also the new digital portal, which did take pressure off, off the phone system, frankly. Uh, and, and if it's slow time, we would encourage people to use that and there's guidance on our website. Um, the type of calls, uh, we can give some breakdown um, separately to the committee if you want, but they've shifted as the environment we're working in has shifted and the regulations have shifted. So obviously, um, currently, if you, if you project backwards, uh, there are calls uh, uh, about licensing breaches in, in licensed premises, uh, that clearly will change now in relation to the new emphasis given this weekend about house parties. And the general theme over the summer has been about gatherings, depending on the numbers that were, were in place at the time. So that um, they're, they're the things that have uh, that actually fueled the bulk 
uh, clearly there will sometimes be specific calls that relate to crimes and incidents where we know people involved in them are suspected or, or actually have COVID, and that will then trigger a different response, which is coordinated through a command centre here, so that we have to take, take send the specially trained officers and specially equipped officers to do well those calls. But we can, we can give uh, a breakdown to you separately uh, if you want. Okay, no, I'm, I'm just interested in the kind of general themes, but um, if there's more detail, uh, that can be given to us, yes, I would appreciate that. In, in terms of the, the fixed notices you had mentioned, I think, in the past uh, week, maybe it's specific to the Holy Lands, the 46, uh, the, the 40 yeah. fixed notices. Do you have the number of penalty notices that have been issued from the commencement of these regulations right at the very start from, from March? Yes, I do. Um, it, 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 in, in terms of, um, there's different ones here, but the, the freedom of movement stuff, the, the Regulation 5, there's uh, 517 on the latest figures they've got. All the other regulations are 145. Um, there's some uh, contraventions of uh, Regulation 7, where there's 31. And there's currently, on the latest figures I've got, um, we've issued 34 prohibition notices, which aren't quite the same as a fixed penalty ticket. So taken together, uh, the total amount of interventions of the public is just shy of 1,500 when you allow other methods of, of, of dealing with the thing. We have something here called a community resolution notice as well. So that enforcement has, has fluctuated at different times depending on the issues that we've been facing. And we keep a close eye on making sure that there is consistency on the application of those powers because... If like the, the issue of a ticket will always go through the centralised command centre to make sure that the, the approach we're taking is, is not treating people differently. Yeah, and, and that consistency, I know it, it is important. The, the, fixed, the, the notices around movement, I'm assuming, has greatly diminished. That, that, I, that would have been at, yes. the, at the very early stages. Um, so it is, it is in the other aspects now where there's a focus. And I suppose question just on that has there been any fixed notice on the wearing of or not wearing of face masks issued i'm, I'm not aware of any in terms of face masks no um, and in, in terms of the parties that, that that are taking place if you want to just elaborate on how, how are the police going to be going about enforcing these new rules to do with people's restrictions on their homes which is largely where the current proposals are so and, and that that brings you into obviously tension so there's there's very blatant breaches that will take place and that's been evidenced by what, what we have witnessed in the in the holy lands but take for example the number of exemptions in that that's in place for people's homes you're allowed to bubble with a family how would the police deal with the scenario where there a report comes through that there's 12 people in someone's home made up of a combination of uh, adults and then those that are under the age of 12 and they just say well this is my bubble and then a week later the same report comes through it's a different family and they just say but this is my bubble are the police going to be investigating whether or not people have been truthful as to what actually constitutes a bubble do people need to register who they're bubbled with is it one set of grandparents providing child child care is it two um, because that's an exemption when it comes to childcare. So I'm trying to figure out, with these exemptions, how actually will that be enforced? And are you down to the honesty and, and common sense approach of the public when it comes to, to this aspect of people's homes? Well, I think that's probably where we take up an answer for good chair, that the, the, the underpinning assumption in, in an awful lot of this, and who knows, we don't know what yet may come in terms of further restrictions and regulations, is to rely on people's interpretation of common sense, pragmatism and being reasonable, because we all have a part to play. Um, clearly, there is a tension for us in policing terms about, you know, a concern, may, maybe like to previous questions about is it safe to go to a funeral? We, we have to respect that as far as we can, we're not here to interfere with daily life and the tempo of people's, how they go about their daily business. Um, clearly, the regulations and guidance are increasingly complex in this space. And I personally have heard people almost seeking advice in terms of who's in your bubble, um, how you can go about picking children up from school and all this sort of complexity. So I think to reassure the public, we've got a balance to strike by 
coming down in an enforcement space against people that are just completely irresponsible. For example, antisocial behaviour, disturbances, house parties that got completely out of hand, which is the picture we've seen, sadly, in the Holy Lands over the last couple of weeks. And, and actually just people acting reasonably in, in, in other spaces. And that three years approach, if we are called to a house where there may be potentially be a breach, that, that initially it would be about encouraging and, and explain, explaining the regulation and encouraging people to desist because we don't want to be seen, if you like, as an army of occupation that's going through burst through every door in Northern Ireland if, if, um, if, if something like this is reported to us. The contact centre that we have does assess the calls and either gives advice over the phone as well or will assess if there's a need for police deployment. So we're we are conscious how, how people are concerned in the short term because we've seen if you go back over the summer as regulations have changed, that how people interpret them, improve their understanding and moderate their behaviour. But the big bit for us here is to support the endeavour of, of the health minister to keep us all safe. But it is that fine line, as I say. Okay, thank you. And, and I, I agree with uh, the approach that you're taking on that. It's those that are blatantly breaking the law that undermine um, everyone's good intentions. Um, in, in terms of the prohibition notices, can you... The ones that have been issued in the Holy Lands, can you just explain to me what, what exactly is being prohibited? Well, I, I wouldn't have details of specific cases um, in, in relation to that. The notice would, would, having seen one myself issued when I was out on patrol recently in Belfast in the licensed premises, um, they, will, they will prohibit certain behaviour. So in the Holy Lands largely, it will be about indoor gatherings. I haven't got the detail whether any have been issued to licensed premises in and around the Holy Lands. Does, but does, the, the, notice, the notice specifies what the breach is. Okay, and does that issue against the landlord as opposed to, you know, there's the penalty notices that would go on the issue, but who does the prohibition notice be issued against? Well, it depends who's breaching the regulations, frankly. So um, it will be the occupant if it's a home. Okay. Um, let me bring in. Rachel, and then I'll bring in Doug. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, I'll follow on just about prohibition notices. Um, in terms of, the, the, obviously these will change now with the different regulations, but would there ever be a scenario that social distancing would be appearing on a prohibition notice, given that there are no enforcement powers over social distancing? Well, I, th I think it's the key thing, isn't it? That at social distance is guidance. Uh, we're appealing to common sense that, and, and obviously social distance applies in different contexts, doesn't it? We all try and touch social distance at work. Uh, there is clear guidance around uh, use of face masks, etc., uh, in in public transport, in enclosed in spaces. So that again is is, is complex and nuanced. But um, the, the the guidance isn't an issue. We did the guidance isn't something we'd issue a notice for. It's only for breach of regulations. Okay. Um, just to sort of tease that out again, in terms if there was a prohibition notice served and there had one of the reasons for it was not adhering to social distancing, is that something that the police can actually enforce? Well, that, that's all about depends. If it's a gathering in a home and numbers is one thing, if you mean that bit of social distancing, but keeping two metres apart uh, in another scenario might be something where we just give advice in the 3E space. Okay. Um, just on the bit of information that we'd received in our pack in terms of the breaches of the regulation by incident type, and that's from March to June. Um, part of that has 37% of the incidents for breaches of regulations were actually breaches of guidance, not regulations. Um, just wondering, uh, maybe it's a comment from me more than the, anything that the guidance actually isn't overly clear for a lot of people of what is regulation and what is guidance, but also how much sort of police time does that equate to? Um, I, I couldn't give a finer answer to police time because different incidents uh, take different amounts of time. So for example, if you go back to the summer months where we were called to some of the beaches in Crawford's Burn and Helen's Bay that hit the news, clearly responding to that would have taken hours. Uh, other incidents we might, we might deal with more quickly. I, I think uh, despite best efforts, so I wouldn't disagree that both uh, individuals, you know, listening to this broadcast for our officers, indeed for the community at large, sometimes the, the guidance is increasingly complex and, and difficult. So that's why sort of reference to online tools 
to, to actually help me people make decisions, I think is important. It includes our officers because very many different situations are unique and we need to get the balance right. And I think any simplification of regulations and of guidance, I think will help everyone. Thank you, I would certainly agree with that. And just finally, is there in existence any internal guidance for the police on the health protection regulations and how they're enforced? Yes, there is. Um, from, from the outset, we've tried to follow um, both advice uh, from the National Police Chiefs Council and also from the executive here uh, about how we operate um, across the estate in terms of social distancing in our buildings. And also you may well have seen now it's routine for officers on patrol and police vehicles to wear face masks throughout their shift, to keep themselves safe and indeed to keep the public safe so that we keep a close eye on that. We have regular operational meetings led by our gold commander, Alan Todd, that does receive the latest medical advice and opinion. Uh, we have now pretty strong cleaning regimes. We have significant stocks of uh, personal protective equipment, a whole range of different scenarios, so that we're trying as hard as we can to keep ourselves safe, that, so that we continue to police the streets as well as not infect anyone else. Okay, thank you. Um, Doug? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I thank you, Chief Constable. Um, it's topical. Um, you know I was going to ask it, so I'm going to. Um, can you give us an update on the uh, investigation into the Bobby Story funeral? Um, and I'm looking at this from a reputational damage uh, point of view. Um, and can we include how many people who have been given letters to appear for uh, interview by the, the police? Yeah, I, I can give an update. Um, obviously, the first thing is not assuming everyone knows the whole story. Um, so that uh, since the, um, there was public concern, a lot of public concern about that funeral, we've appointed uh, an independent deputy chief constable from Cumbria, Mark Webster, to oversee our investigation into the funeral. Uh, he's supported by a trained and accredited detective superintendent uh, and a team of officers that are reviewing uh, different types of, uh, of footage to see where there are potential breaches, the regulations at a number of different places. Having begun and are working our way through that process, 24 people have now received letters inviting them to make arrangements for interview with us in the next 14 days. Well, the clock's ticking. It's probably about the next seven now. Um, so uh, we, are, we, are, we are in dialogue with those 24 people. Um, and obviously, as the investigation progresses, uh, we, we can update further. But I'm conscious I don't want to say too much because you'll be appreciate it is a live investigation. Absolutely, and thank you for that. It is a live investigation, and I guess people are still really sort of interested in this because of the damage that it created in our um, health message during COVID. Have you any idea, um, Chief Constable, roughly when we're likely to see the end of this investigation, or is it just one of those things that we're just going to have to wait until it's done? No, we, we're actually, because of the nature of the offence here, we're, we're bound by a six-month window to get the evidence to the, to, to the prosecution service. So uh, the, um, Mark Webster is, is conscious of deadlines and the need to get the best evidence, but also to submit it to the prosecution service in a timely manner. So at the moment, the best estimate is, is within the next couple of weeks. OK. And, and Chief, Chief Constable, another question which wasn't on the list that I was going to ask you, but it only just came up. Could you just, and it's a pointed question, could you just let us know who from the police attends the Executive COVID Enforcement Working Group? <coughs> Yes, it's uh, ACC Alan Todd normally. Thank you. And just to tidy up on the, the funeral question, um, at this stage of the investigation, do you think it's likely there will be a report sent to the Public Prosecution Service? Well, the, the way the regulation or the, the law works here is there has to be, so um, there will be. Okay. Thank you. Paul Free. Yeah, just to... Uh, Keep on the theme of the Bobby Story funeral. Um, can I ask also, is, is Mark Webster investigating the role or any role that PSNI officers played in liaison with Sinn Féin and the political party in organising some events around the Bobby Story funeral? Uh, for instance, the sham oration in the graveyard. Well, I think it's, it's, it is a live investigation. 
I think from the discussions I've had, the best thing I can say to sort of try and satisfy is that he has had to satisfy himself of whatever dialogue there has been between anyone in the PSNI and anyone purporting to arrange the funeral. And that's about the most I can say at the moment. Okay. Uh, just a, a question then from me around the enforcement of face coverings. That phrase sounds horrendous to me. There's absolutely no way that I would support the enforcement of face masks on individuals when the police officers involved will not know uh, the private situations of any person uh, and their health conditions. Um, and we know in the past the police has got it wrong with regards to geography and where retail shops are and aren't in, in our hamlets and our towns. And I do think that the police would get that wrong also, uh, especially when the guidance does not state that you have to wear a face mask in all occasions and at all times and in all places. Um, and indeed, if you, it, only if you can't adhere to social distancing and other requirements. Um, just on the police uh, operation of wearing face masks, do you expect your officers to wear the masks at all times on operational duties? Well, the colour bits there, if, if I may. Firstly, in, in relation to the general public, um, we, we don't really want to be in the space of forcing someone to put a mask on, and I think it would be probably disingenuous to create that um, impression that we would use force to make someone do that. Um, we, we would really want to rely on, on this three, three E's of the four E approach. That if there were circumstances where there was a justified need for us in, to intervene, for example, on a train to support um, a, a guard who's trying to uh, ask someone to wear a mask, absolutely. But we also recognise, and quite right, that there are individual circumstances and we will take those into account, which is why there isn't sort of an assumption that we, we leap straight to enforcement. In terms of our own officers and staff, it, in, the, in the public space, uh, it will depend on the circumstances. So as I said earlier, we're now sort of asking officers uh, and staff to wear face masks in vehicles, because you would imagine for sort of 10 hour shifts or so, they are confined spaces. I was out with, the, uh, with some colleagues last night, just doing that, just that myself. Um, equally, in certain scenarios, uh, you will see officers wearing a lot of personal protective equipment, as I said earlier, uh, when we're dealing with specific COVID-related issues. And frankly, as the officers and staff that work, work with us uh, are as anxious about catching the virus as anyone else, in certain instances of close contact, they will be encouraged to wear a face mask as they deem appropriate. And if you saw, for example, pictures of a, a knife crime in Belfast in the media the other day, you will see officers wearing a mask then. We are not routinely saying in public space, if you can socially distance, that you have to, to wear a mask though. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. I, I'm, I'm, and I've, I've been on record before saying that I have sympathy with the PSNI with regards to trying to police what I believe is very draconian legislation. And in fact, we're actually legislating in people's living rooms. Not that they would commit crime in their living room, but even just the amount of people and the numbers within. And I just think that this whole legislative piece is, is very worrying that we've had to go down this road. So I do have sympathy for the police trying to police this draconian legislation. But do you, do you admit also uh, and, and recognise and acknowledge also that whilst they have the sympathy of policing this, that there have been some scenes and scenarios where the policing of situations has gravely undermined the message, just as much as any politician for that matter undermining the, the message, and that that has done grievous damage to the common sense requirement that is probably the one element that's saving most lives uh, as we go through this pandemic, and that sometimes the police's inaction uh, in, in circumstances, uh, Bobby Story Funeral being one of them, but being slightly different because at the, the, the heart of that, somebody, it was somebody's funeral. Uh, but other scenarios where there has been mass gatherings in Belfast, for instance, and then also uh, in the partying around the Holy Land, which shouldn't take place at any given year, whether we're in pandemic or not. Uh, but that can, that, the policing or the inaction of policing in those situations can really undermine the message and the common sense message that we need to get out there for people to protect themselves. 
Well, I think it's an interesting point you raised because quite, quite fundamentally, I think you pick up that the regulations are complex. Um, the regulations are passed by the government and our institutional position actually is, is to support the rule of law. So that that's the first bit in the, in the Police Act that we have to abide by. Um, if there are specific examples of it in action um, that you want us to look at, well, we can try and provide more detail. But sometimes we're asking officers to make very nuanced decisions fast times. And in a complex organisation of nearly 10,000 people dealing with 500 emergency calls a day, sometimes we will get things wrong. But I, I've seen personally, I've been out on patrol an awful lot during this COVID period about the tolerance the patients and the encouragement that officers and staff have, have, have gone through to try and support people going about their daily lives whilst supporting the spirit of the regulations, which after all are here to keep us safe and healthy. So that um, the, 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 the broader debate of, as I touched on in my introduction, how we policed bonfires, parades, protest. Well, one of my reflections of policing here in the last 18 months that often we are heroes and villains. So action will, will go down well with one community and might be seen as less than satisfactory with another. And that's the difficulty we have sometimes in balancing the proportionality and justification of what we're doing. It's something that we'll, you know, we will continue to look at. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Members, we'll move on. Um, sorry. I'm oh, sorry, Linda. I actually have a, a, a number of questions that I, I want to put to the Chief Constable. And thank you again, Simon, for, for some of your answers. I think there's been some interesting points raised here today. And first of all, I am also on record. ACC Todd was here before the committee several times in relation to the COVID regulations. And on record as saying that I believe that the PSNA, in a very difficult circumstance, had got the balance right as far as possible. And, and as you've, you've outlined yourself, there were, there were certain mistakes made. But I think, given the circumstances that you were in, that mistakes will always be made. We're all human, and we have to accept that mistakes will be made. And, and where you can accept that they weren't blatant or there wasn't any malice intent, I think that it's fair enough to, to say that mistakes will be made. Can I just, sorry to turn and yes. I was one of the people who received a letter in relation to Bobby's funeral, the funeral of a very close friend of my family for over 20 years. So I just need to declare that interest before, before I go any further. I think in the balance, for, for the most part, in fairness to yourselves, you have got it right. I think the political and media pressure is maybe coming to bear and that balance is starting to fall away slightly because Everything we've heard in this room today is about Bobby's funeral, whilst we know that there were many other funerals where there was certainly, and the blatant hypocrisy in this room would actually sicken you. There were many other funerals where the rules were also broken, and, and that, that's okay. And the right approach was taken, because the PSNA took a balanced approach. We've heard about the Holy Lands, but we haven't heard where there were other incidents at other events. And I think that students, again, and am I right? I suppose there's, there is a question here, Chair, so apologies for taking a bit of time to get to it. Am I right in saying that most of the notices given out in the Holy Lands were not given to students? Uh, yes, broadly. I haven't got the exact figures in front of me, but I, I, we can get them to you. But the pattern has been sometimes it's been students, but the bulk have been people that haven't been studying at university, but have been seeing people that have. And I think it's important to get that point out because students are absolutely being put up, hung out to dry here, as though they are a law unto themselves and that there aren't very, very good students that are out there doing the right thing all day, every day. So I think that we need, it. We need to make that point here. And again, that is not down to the PSNA, that is down to political motivations and media led. So to be fair to yourselves, that's, that's not actually your responsibility. Can I ask also, are there any other investigations ongoing? And have anyone else outside of those att who attended Bobby Story's funeral received letters in relation to those investigations? Um, yes, the latest figures that I've got is that um, I think I've seen figures around 20 other funerals during the, if you could describe it as the COVID period. 13 of those investigations have now been closed because in terms of the, 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 the fleeting nature of the breach, it wouldn't be portionate to take to take action. Uh, there's, I think it's from memory, another six are still remaining under investigation, plus the one you referenced yourself. 
Okay. And just then, in relation to the neighbourhood policing, and, and you've alluded to this yourself, the importance of it, and, and in your review with the Gardaí, which I think is, is really, really good and positive. And I think even in terms of going forward, and, and Gordon had questioned whether some PSNI officers would be moved back into COVID duties out of neighbourhood teams. I think we just need to reinforce the importance of actually the neighbourhood teams, and, and I'm sure you know this yourself, Simon, because it's something that I know you're, you're passionate around, is, is the neighbourhood policing element. The neighbourhood teams play a really, really important role, and I know in my area, where there was a, a wee period there where we didn't have a sergeant, um, it, it created some difficulties because actually the community built up relationships with these neighbourhood teams, and where there are then breaches of, of COVID rules, the community will speak to the neighbourhood teams where they may not necessarily want to go through the 101 or to the... Um, even to the to the app or the, the online way of doing it. So I think that it, that, that is important. It's important to maintain that neighbourhood policing presence. And, and I would hope that that would be something that would be focused focused on. And just to support what Paul Frew said around the enforcement of wearing masks, particularly within retail settings, I, I just don't know how the police or PSNI would get involved in that. I think it would be impossible. I mean, I'm not, I'm not even sure that anybody who works in those premises should be getting involved in that because there are exemptions to who has to wear a mask. And if you have someone with a learning difficulty that is not necessarily a visible, visible disability, we heard from people on the radio this week who are deaf and who have challenges and difficulties around the wearing of masks and, and many other kinds of challenges, whether it be breathing difficulties and, and different issues like that. And those who just take the stance that they are not accepting the, the, the wearing of a mask. So I think that we, we have to get the balance. And in this, we all have to get the balance, the PSNI and, and all of ourselves as well. And we have to take responsibility in getting the balance. And the balance in all circumstances and all situations. Not the balance when it suits and no balance when it doesn't. So I think in fairness to yourselves, you have... You have done quite a bit of good work there, but I'd, I'd, I would support Paul's comments around the, the wearing of the masks, and I think it would be impossible for yourselves, and I don't think it would be fair to put you in that position either. Well, I think two quick responses, is, uh, if I can, Chair. F firstly, both yourself and indeed the policing board, uh, where I'm going shortly um, for, for another discussion, we've been very clear on a commitment that we would collapse neighbourhood policing, if you can see it in those terms. As an action of last resort, um, it, you know, we, we don't quite know whether the spread of the virus will progress over the winter months. But as you say, Linda, now I recognise how important neighbourhood policing is, and it's effectively one of the talismans of my leadership of this organisation. That you know, we want to continue to invest in it, uh, build relationship with communities across the country, and actually improve officers' skills to do that well. So I think I recognise how hugely important that is, and just to stress that. You know, the, the preferred approach to most of what we deal with in the COVID space is almost that sort of uh, phrase, just talk. So that, that where we do have to come into contact with people reaching the regulations, not guidance, we, we would, you know, prefer that there's a resolution that doesn't result in enforcement. And, and clearly uh, the issues you raise with people having a whole variety of different medical needs that may mitigate against wearing a mask is something we'd be alive to when we're in any encounter. Okay. Emma? Can I just ask um, a question? It's just on, on a, a different theme. Um, <clears throat> it was an incident that happened um, locally, and I, I just wanted to get your sense, um, Chief Constable, what um, it, it could be an operational matter, I'm not sure, but it was when a member of the public um, approached some of your officers um, with details of, of drugs being sold locally on a social media platform. The member of the public took it to um, the, the local police and were told they could do nothing with it. To me, this undermines the, the, the community place that we spent the last 35 minutes talking about. Um, they were told, no, we can't use that. This person had went. They were very, very... Um, they were concerned about this. There was a, a array of, of different... Um, drugs that were being sold out of the boot of someone's car, it had the details of their name, it had the details of their car, where they were going to be, and they were just told, no, sorry, we can't use that. Um, the, the person approached us, and they, they weren't happy about it, and, and rightly so. Well, thank you for raising that. Um, 
I think actually, you know, the response at, at first hand would surprise me and frankly disappoint me that we weren't keen on finding out who's peddling drugs in our community because I talked earlier about drug seizures being up because we recognise we, we have to take that issue seriously. Um, if, you, if you, probably best, if you want to contact my office after, after the meeting with details and we can get that up with fresh eyes. Okay, thank you. Yes, sorry, sorry Gemma. Sir, I just have one, go ahead. One final question. Um, thank you for, for joining us today. Um, just around, the, we know that the domestic violence rates increased um, during the lockdown period. Um, I'm just wondering, how has this played out over the summer months when restrictions are being eased a little? Um, well, there's a, a few issues here on, on, on d d the domestic motivated incidents that they, they, they dropped, they peaked, and they're, they're sort of broadly stable again. So it's been a bit like um, a wave on a choppy sea. Um, I, th I think the, the issue that I, I think is really important that this, this is, again, a bit like neighborhood policing that Linda mentioned. It's one of the top priorities I've, I've set ourselves as an organization. And actually, Mark, who's beside me on the call, is actually leading some of our response to domestic abuse. I've said more than once, frankly, this is the one crime where we know who does it, so that we need to do all we can to protect victims and bring people to justice. So a small example of that is where we've improved outcome rates and charges for people that injure their partners uh, in, in a domestic setting, so that we are looking at um, how we respond to the initial call, how we make swift arrest, and how we get best evidence to the PPS to protect people. But it's a thing we're keeping a close eye on, and clearly one of the undercurrents of even the, 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 the most recent restrictions are the mental health and strain that people feel would can lead to disputes within families. So we will monitor the issues closely. But um, broadly, we have seen some stabilization in the incidents in recent weeks. Thank you. Gemma. Okay, members, I need to move on because the Chief Constable is leaving us at 12. That's when this element of the meeting will finish. And we have a number of questions still to get through. If we've got time, I'll open up to other areas that were previously notified. Um, the PSNI resources and staffing um, is, is one of the areas members had raised. I'll just quickly uh, recap on this uh, and then invite those members in. So, Chief Constable, one was around a general question to do with plans being in place, if there are any, around pl rationalising police stations and upgrading retained buildings to modern standards. And you had already touched on recruitment issues. Um, that was an aspect that some members had raised about the recruitment of officers. I'm not sure if we need to cover that ground again. But if you want to comment just on the, the plans around police stations and the other question, and this was from Rachel, around the changes to the police pension scheme. Okay. Um, well, I may bring um, my deputy Mark, who's on the call, chair, to deal with the police pension scheme. Um, I'm not sure he's an independent financial advisor, but I know he's been researching this carefully for you. So, um, I'll, I'll, if, if, if I deal with the other issues first, um, certainly to reassure people that after the, uh, the spring campaign uh, to attract people into organisation, the assessment centre process has continued. So, we are progressing plans that we're still confident we'll achieve to actually grow the headcount of the organisation to 7,100 officers by the end of the financial year, which will be the highest it's been for some time. That equates to 7,000 real people, because some, some of the officers that work for us work part-time. Uh, we're also keen to continue to work with the government to increase to the, the 7,500 commitment that was uh, outlined uh, early in the year. In terms of a state, um, I think there's a couple of things. So I know police stations locally are always hugely important in emotive issues about signs of presence in, in the public space. So I'll come on to that in a minute. Broadly at the moment, uh, and I'm working closely with the chair of the policing board on this matter and the head of the Department of Finance, we are, we are assessing where across, if you like, the greater Belfast area, we have headquarters sites. So for example, the one that I sit in at the moment, um, that if we came out of those sites and coalesced in a different place, it, still within the greater Belfast area, could we sort of rid ourselves of some of the, the, the legacy of the past with a small L in terms of many of our buildings that are old, decrepit and inefficient, and look to see how we bring together the normal head office functions, if you like, the police college, a contact centre, 
and a new centre to tackle organised crime that will be similar to the model you see in Scotland. So th those, those efforts are, are working quite quickly and we're trying to see how we take advantage of uh, the ability to borrow money in the current economic environment and also, frankly, come up with a plan that will create jobs if we're able to begin to build a new headquarters estate in a radically different way. Uh, secondly, if you see this as a 10-year plan, I think we all recognise that despite um, the, 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 sort of the, the, the efforts to sort of improve our state in the past, some of our buildings are more modern than others. I am the proud landlord, I think, of 185 porter cabins, which is not acceptable working environment in the modern age to, to have officers and staff working in. And we'd want to work closely with district councils in the next 10 years to see where we can make our buildings uh, look in less militarised, uh, look more welcoming and, and actually be assets that the community could use as well. That will take longer to come to fruition uh, because of some of the changes we'd have to make to the environment in which we work. It may mean on occasions um, closing certain sites to, to build new ones still within a particular town that are more modern and fit for purpose if we can get the financial support to do it. And I imagine Many people on the committee or even watching will have their own examples of buildings that really don't reflect our modern values and how you'd want to interact with a modern public service. Okay. Um, before you introduce Mark then on the pension uh, aspect, Chief Constable Gordon, you had asked around the police stations issue. Yeah, I think that uh, you've covered it fairly well there. I just I think it's important, I suppose we're aware that you have bids for uh, future uh, refurbishment and establishing the major projects that you've just mentioned. I suppose we're, we're not fully aware of all of that, but I think it's important that those bids are, are you know, put forward. And uh, we would encourage you, obviously, to invest. We're fully aware of the, the port of cabin issue. You've, you've talked about it, to be fair, since you came into that job. You've raised that with us on a number of occasions. I think it's important we continue to, to push that as a priority. I suppose locally in North Down we have seen the rationalisation of a number of stations. Uh, we still have the Hollywood station now, which is virtually unmanned. I suppose there's a question mark hanging over the future of it. And I know the police use it for operational vehicles, but not for, I suppose, public use within brackets. And um, the Bangor station has had some work done, but probably needs further work. But we would certainly urge you to continue with your plans and we'll do what we can to push for further funding for capital schemes, I suppose, and uh, make sure that, that your premises are fit for purpose. Can well, thank you, Chair. That support's really encouraging because, frankly, we, we need the capital. Um, we, we spend a small fortune each year on just building maintenance and keeping the estate going. And obviously, if we can modernise, we can divert a lot of that into other, other services or, or, or other improvements and modernisation, but I, I know you want to speak to, to Mark as well about the police pension care scheme. Yes, and, and finally, and, and I'll introduce the, the, the Deputy Chief Constable, the, the new decade, new approach made that commitment of 7,500. Can I ask if the Department for Justice has formally put forward a bid to the Department of Finance for the funding necessary to give you uh, the 400 additional officers that would be needed to to uh, fulfil that commitment and that agreement? I don't think so yet. Uh, we submitted a, an outline business case in, in sort of management jargon to the Department of Justice, which outlined our reasons for why we wanted to grow to 7,500 officers. I'm not personally aware from any conversation I've had with officials that it has actually moved any further. And is this an issue that you've escalated with the Minister uh, to get ministerial support for this? It's, it's an issue uh, that I've actually escalated with the policing board because they, they have a, an opportunity to advocate for us. I'm seeing the board in about an hour's time, not looking at the watch. Uh, it's a thing they're also supportive of and recognising their role to support us in, in, in trying to grow the headcount, the organisation, to meet the agreement. Okay. Um, Deputy Chief Constable, if you want to come in on the, the, the pension issue. Uh, yes, good morning, Chair and members, and actually further to the Chief's <coughs> last comment on the 7,500, um, our three-year three CSR highlight bid has been reported to the Department of Justice and therefore the DOF. The costs that we would see in terms of growing the organisation each year 
uh, over the next number of years to seven hundred thousand. So we we put in that as a as a, as a, as an as an original outline bid just in our in our in our submissions in the last month or so from three years CSR. Just moving on to um, the pension scheme, obviously, um, in the Court of Appeal in 2018 ruled the transitional protection offered under the under the old pension scheme, the new pension scheme was unlawful, and has offered a uh, government has now offered a remedy which the the executive is reporting on. There was a closure of that exit that uh, consultation, and now comes in the end of November. We're working very closely with the department um, to try and work our way forward, but basically um, they're offering a proposal of either immediate choice or a deferred choice underpin to the members affected, and the members affected are those who had to effectively join the police service before the 31st of March 2012. It doesn't affect anybody after the 1st of April 2015. And we reckon that that's going to affect between five and 7,000 serving or former officers um, during the period. Um, we are working closely to try and decide which is the best choice in terms of the immediate choice um, and effectively what they're going to offer is whether or not you would take the benefits of the scheme from, of the old scheme, the prior to 2015 scheme, take those benefits from 2015 to the end of the remedy period, which is in March 2022, um, or deferred choice where you would defer um, the choice of that till the day you retire. So effectively what we have to offer those maybe 7,000 people is whether or not they want to avail of an extra seven years on the old pension scheme or the new pension scheme. Um, that's going to raise an awful lot of issues because every single person affected needs to have um, uh, a financial statement given to them to help them understand which scheme would be the best scheme for them to engage in. And they need advice around that. Um, and the, the two of the different options may have different tax implications for people. And also then there's a huge administrative burden for the chief constable and, and those who administer the scheme. So our initial sense is that you know, we would be probably preferring the deferred choice where we work out for each officer um, what is the implication for them when they retire, as opposed to trying to do thousands in one go in the immediate period after April 2022. There's going to be another, a number of other issues to, to, to sort out. So, for example, those people who have died in the period, people who have got divorced. There are also other issues, for example, that the, the pre-15 scheme recognises and provides for spouses, but didn't provide for partners, uh, whereas the post-15 scheme does provide for partners, so there may be different choices for different people. And all in all, in our conversations this week, we feel that we could probably be dealing with the issue for maybe up to 30 years, uh, Chair, in terms, of, uh, in terms of managing out the pension uh, calculation for each person who has joined prior to 2012 and their potential retirement date um, over the next 30 years and those who have already retired. Um, one of the major concerns for us is going to be the capacity of the PSNI to manage all this. The date's coming along very quickly, and obviously this will all be subject to enabling legislation both in Westminster and in support of Belfast. Um, and there's going to be quite an administrative burden upon, upon us to provide the figures to everybody to make their choice um, at the appropriate time. Uh, there's also a view that there'll need to be independent financial advice for people available, and maybe independent tax advice for them to make the right choice to avoid litigation further on down the line if people feel that they were um, maybe advised to take the wrong the wrong mechanism. So um, it's, the consultation will end. Um, we'll see what the final remedy uh, is, but clearly we feel that really for over the next 18 months there could be a lot of effort in place to try and get us ready for the April 22 uh, deadline and make quite considerable effort to manage uh, every other, every member. And the last thing to note is the Home Office has just, in the last number of weeks, given permission to, in England and Wales, to police services to um, start working through the choice remedy for people who are about to immediately retire, um, because the, the, the court, hold, the court um, judgment said there should be no immediate detriment. So we're waiting to see if, if there's going to be any instructions from the Department of Finance here as to whether or not we should work, start to work immediately on those who are retiring now, to give them the advice that they would need um, to make the right decision, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mark. I suspect this is an issue we, the committee will, will need to get its head around as well. Rachel had asked the question, so I'm happy to bring Rachel in. Then I'm going to stay with Rachel, and I'm going to invite her 
to ask her remaining questions, which were on the domestic abuse uh, bill, uh, Operation Nexus, and uh, the body-worn video cameras, because I'm, I'm aware we've only got 14 minutes left for this session. And then Doug had a question on spit hood, so I'm going to stick with Rachel for the next three questions, then Doug, and I suspect that will take us to 12 o'clock. I'll be very quick. Thank you. That was very comprehensive. Um, I'm just wondering if uh, the PSNI has had any input into the current proposals that are out for consultation. Did you respond to the consultation? So, um, probably at two levels. So, our, uh, we were responding uh, individually through our various staff associations, and then we, as an organisation, were responding through the Department of Justice. So, we will be making um, our our view known as to which way we should go forward with the immediate choice or deferred choice under PIN. And as I say, our feeling is that we will be recommending the deferred choice under PIN for uh, the reasons of just administrating um, the process going forward. Chair. Thank you. Um, then I'll go on to the domestic abuse um, and family proceedings bill. As you'll be aware, we're still looking at this in committee. Um, have the police had any input so far into the guidance that is being drafted by the department? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> that was great. Okay. Um, that was a good answer. <laughs> in terms of just the just for later on and the type of the type and length of training that is currently given to PSNI officers, um, new and existing, on domestic abuse, how long is it for, and who runs it, and is there refresher courses? Um, well, I'll, I'll let Mark come with some of the breadth. I think there's maybe two issues there, isn't it? If I've understood it right, uh, forgive me. So, when the bill is passed, uh, we're looking at the moment of beginning training from December for about 3,000 frontline officers to carry out different roles. Um, and that will be a mixture of classrooms subject to the COVID restrictions or, or online learning, where we've had to put a lot of our effort in recent months. Um, in terms of the specifics around training, it will apply if, you, if you're looking backwards around different roles because, for example, the public protection teams, there's different levels of accreditation that officers have to achieve there, whether you're a frontline detective or, for example, a, a detective chief inspector running a whole uh, investigative syndicate. Um, that will play out in different ways. Um, clearly, then there's different training for custody officers and people who are in the custody environment around legislation, as well as for frontline staff. But I don't know if there's anything else you want to... Up, well, I think it's, a, it's important to note, so the, the, the subject matter that we're particularly looking at in terms of the online training starting from December is around getting officers familiar with what coercive and, and controlling behaviour would look like, um, so that when they're dealing with incidents, they, they, they recognise it. We have been developing that programme with Women's Aid, and as the Chief Constable said, that will roll out from December. Um, so that we have officers up to, to a certain level of competence, um, both in their day-to-day -day work as we, as we go forward, but also in preparation for the bill. Um, and then we will, um, in, in terms of preparing uh, for the bill, uh, we, will, we will go to classroom-based training in, in, with all the conditions that that currently requires. And if that's still the situation we're in, in order that we, uh, because we think it's so important actually to have that face-to-face -face, um, training environment and those inputs from uh, the partners that we work with. Thank you. Um, in terms of my second question then on Operation Nexus, is that in operation in Northern Ireland? Um, and how is the PSNI operating this, if it is? Yeah, uh, sorry, it, it is an operation in Northern Ireland. It's, it's part of a UK-wide scheme to make sure that we pick up people that are, are wanted uh, in other jurisdictions and it could continue to cause harm in communities here if we didn't address them. So effectively, it's a check that's carried out in the custody centre when someone's arrested that runs through some of the systems that we were talking about early in the, in the session uh, around um, European foreign nationals that may be wanted in other jurisdictions. Um, so it's about using it as a tool to com keep communities safe. back to you on that one when we've got more time. In terms of body-worn video, um, it's my understanding that after an incident finishes, the body-worn video was turned off, but is there any guidance on when an incident is finished? <laughs> um, 
I think uh, I'll have to check the fine detail of the policy there. There, there is there is a lot of guidance in relation to the use of body worn video. Um, I think um, in in relation to what we would say to officers, there are certain is, is incidents where we effectively prescribe a must. So, for example, use of spit hoods, which may be a question you, 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 you sense was going to come in a minute, Chair. Uh, domestic abuse incidents, going back to your previous question, where it's it's really good for gathering uh, first evidence that can support prosecution. Uh, things like uh, stop search, uh, motoring encounters, and, and so on. So we, re we rely on officers sort of um, following that guidance and then having the confidence to use it in other interactions. I, for my, my sense, again, I was only out last night with some frontline officers. They see it as a really good tool both to gather evidence, but frankly, also to protect themselves where, where they're accused, for example, of using too much force, being rude to people. Um, we, it's something I'm keen to continue investing in as part of what we're calling digital policing. Um, we're, we're looking to re renew uh, body-worn equipment across the organization uh, to, to, to take advantage of how we could beam it using Wi-Fi back to, um, to police control centers and things like that. So I think the guidance of when it's finished, frankly, will depend on uh, specifically what the issue is. So, for example, if you imagine an arrest, which would presumably cover the encounter into a police car, it would depend on the circumstances and what equipment's also available in a, in, a, in a car. Because, for example, some of our cell vans are equipped with cameras about when officers would choose to continue filming to protect both themselves and the person they've arrested. So um, it's not always an exact science. Uh, but then we will we would debrief incidents quickly to make sure that we get evidence into the criminal justice system. Okay, thank you. Doug? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Chief Constable. I was going to ask you a question on spit hoods, but we're short on time, um, so I think I'll write to you on that one. So, so uh, okay. I'll, I'll leave that. Um, and, and I hope that the Chair won't mind my liberty of asking you a slightly different question. I, I've had a real influx of uh, police officers and former police officers who are concerned about the police injured on duty assessment procedures. Um, can you explain where we are in regards to that in a minute? Because a lot of them are complaining the fact is that the IMRs are, are not taking place. Um, they're saying due to COVID, yet they are happening with the Northern Ireland uh, Police Service. Uh, and they're also concerned that privately employed professionals who deal with, with mental health care are not being listened to by the SNPs. Yeah, well, funny enough, um, I, I, I know this is a really live and important issue for all sorts of reasons, Doug, because of uh, you know colleagues that are suffering a, a range of issues because of their commitment to service in the past. As you know, it will, it will tend to be for issues like PTSD or, or sort of mobility issues caused by musculoskeletal problems. Uh, the application of the scheme, though, while, whilst we recognise it's important, we recognise it's slowed down because of COVID, is actually a matter for the policing board. We just give advice so that those bits of detail, something you probably would have to get um, a response from the chair or the chief executive, frankly. Okay, and, and, and I guess that's a fair, fair response. Um, but I, I suppose maybe I was just trying to get, get your, your view on it, Chief Constable. I mean, I mean you, you're absolutely quite right that this is incredibly important um, uh, and COVID has not made it easier. But, but I guess it's your view on, on whether these people are being best served by the current procedure or not. And I know it's just a view, that's all I'm asking for. Okay. Um, well, I think there's a couple of things. Clearly, there was a report, you know, there have been well, a number of issues around this, because in one sense, in terms of, if you like, the macro picture, the management of the public purse, this scheme is expensive. And I know there's been a previous concern about the amount of public money the scheme is, is consuming. Um, and, and indeed, how on occasions individuals may almost um, seek to exploit the scheme uh, for their own benefit. Well, we wouldn't con continue if you, or condone gaming a system that's meant to protect officers that sadly can't continue to work because of life-limiting conditions, uh, so, or, or the sort of things I talked about. I think. In broad brush terms, I, I would like to see a scheme that, that's fair and equitable, but also is a lot faster. Um, I think if you imagine if you are someone that's actually trying to work with the rules, um, that is suffering, for example, from PTSD, that can't work anymore and, and just wants to exit the police to try and remedy some of the issues that are troubling them. If, I think if we can speed that up and bring that service to a, a conclusion to the benefit of all parties, that will be success for me. 
Thank, thanks, Chief Council. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll write to you and we'll see if we can organise a meeting with some of your officials just to maybe talk, talk some of it through. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We have two minutes left, so Linda Dillon. Just for Doug's information, the, the Police and Board actually had a specific working group around that issue, and it might be beneficial for you to maybe meet with them that they probably could answer more of the questions than that. And if I can, um, uh, uh, Linda, you, you're right, and I do know that. Some of the complaints I'm getting is about how that working group is applying some of the, 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 the outworkings of it. For example, I'm getting, a, I'm getting people complaining and saying that a medical professional is saying somebody is going off and should be a band four, but that working group is deciding they're a band two. Um, uh, and so there's a concern. So, so you're right. Is there anything for the Chief Constable? Yes. Sorry. Chief Thank you. Constable, can I just ask, um, in relation to the Black, Black Lives Matter protest, he has now used Section 44 of the Serious Crime Act 2007 to caution a number of those involved with the protest on the 6th of June. The Serious Crime Act obviously is what it says. It's supposed to be intended to be used for serious crime. Do you think that the use of the section to, in relation to a peaceful protest was appropriate and proportionate? Um, well, the, I think I would be careful here because obviously, again, this is in, in, in some sense for some people, uh, a prosecution that's, that's been in, in, in process. And I think in a number of cases, files have now been submitted to the PPS. I think I'm doing this from memory, but I think another one, someone accepted a caution. Um, so that the, we will also be answering some detailed questions in relation to this next week at the board. Uh, it is also tied into the general examination of the Black Lives Matter protest, Linda, by the, uh, by the Ombudsman. So in terms of appropriateness, uh, and proportionality, I'll be a bit wary of giving an answer at the moment until she's finished her conclusions, but obviously can discuss that at a further committee or at the board once we've had her conclusions, no which we anticipate it. in if the next few weeks. At the board, that's fine. That's, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it with the board. Thank you. Finally, no one else. Um, if I can just put on your radar, Chief Constable, um, I've spoken to my own district commander about this, I've spoken to the head of the prison service, and I raised it with the Justice Minister about the planned protest and camp at McGabry Prison, um, and I've made my views clear to, to all of those individuals. My view is that there should be no facilitation whatsoever of what is planned, and it would severely undermine any confidence in other regulations if this protest or camp was facilitated. And I have a constituency interest there, because nobody in, in the village that I represent, McGabry, wants this to be facilitated by the police. So, uh, I'm putting it on your radar. I appreciate there's operational decisions to be taken in respect of that. Hopefully it comes to nothing anyway. Sometimes these things do, um, and it's just flagged up in social media and so on. But uh, I'm just putting that out there that that's my view on the matter. Yeah, I, I think I have heard those views, frankly, Chair, and it, it is likely to be one of a number of protests we'll, we'll be dealing with over the weekend. Chief Constable, can I thank you um, and your team for, for taking the time with us? We've spent a good two hours going through uh, a wide range of issues, and as always, that's very much appreciated. There will be some work streams, I think, that we'll want to pick up um, with the Department of Justice as well on this uh, in due course. But um, for now, thank you and, and best wishes to you and your colleagues. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. OK, members, um, just in terms of time frame for, for how we're proceeding. Um, obviously, we're getting into the bill discussions now. Um, we have to finish this meeting at half one. We have another room booked to continue the meeting at two o'clock to allow members an opportunity to have lunch. Th that is if we don't get through the business in the next 90 minutes. Um, but provision has been made for another committee room to be used by members because we have a duty to report and, and we can't uh, delay the responsibilities on it. So if members are able to work with me, I'll try and get it concluded uh, that we don't need to meet Great. this afternoon, but that is the contingency plan if that becomes necessary. Mm. Okay, well then, let's go into item five on the agenda then, which is the Domestic Abuse Family Proceedings Bill. Um, so members, please bear with me, and at times I might get Christine to provide some information around this as well, and I again acknowledge some of the, the lateness of um, consideration around amendments and so on, but uh, we are where we are. So, uh, at the, the pages that we're looking at here, 79 to 147 of your meeting pack, 
and then also pages 95 to 145 of the table pack. Um, at last week's meeting, the committee discussed further information that was provided by the Department on a number of the clauses uh, in the Bill. The committee agreed to request further clarification from the Department in relation to the term affinity and the text of the proposed departmental amendments for this meeting to enable the committee to complete its deliberations on the provisions of the bill. The committee also agreed to seek the views of the department on a potential amendment uh, the committee is considering in relation to clause 9 and provided its preferred wording of the amendment to clause 25. Uh, the department has provided the further information and the text of its proposed amendments and these can be found at pages 95 to 120 of your tabled pack. A hard copy has also been provided uh, today for members' benefit by way of the amendments, the text of the amendments, um, so that members can make uh, easy reference to them. So we're going to discuss the. Uh, the committee will discuss first um, the issues that are. Uh, covered in the bill. So that's why we have uh, Dr. Veronica Holland and Ms. Jane McGuire from the Department of Justice. And they're here uh, for members' benefit and can come to the can can they don't need to come to the table the, the <laughs> microphones at the appropriate places where they are. So uh, members can get some further clarity on this in respect of uh, these amendments. Okay, so uh, again just to say to members when accepting a clause or an amendment, um, we can express views, we can make comments. The committee, if we're not going down the route of amendments, we can then make recommendations, um, for example, with regard to how uh, a clause should be implemented or the outworkings of that, and that can then be reflected in the committee report on the bill. So the first area that we're going to go to is clauses 5 and 8, which is the meaning of personal uh, connection. The committee agreed that it was content with other aspects of the meaning of personal connection and at the meeting on the 17th of September noted information from the department that indicated that the terms adoptive parent child, foster parent child and kinship care child would come within the scope of parental responsibility but agreed to request a response to the specific questions the committee had raised regarding the term affinity. The department has responded indicating that the provisions in the bill around family members relative um, in terms of those that are covered in it and the terminology used are similar in nature to those contained within the Family Homes and Domestic Violence Act, Northern Ireland 1998. That legislation was considered in the context of the family member relative for the bill and contains a similar reference to relationships being of the full blood, half blood or by affinity. It also contains references to step relationships. The use of the term affinity in legislation refers to the relationship that each person in a marriage has to the relations of the other person. Um, the Departmental Solicitor Office advice uh, wasn't sought on the matter. The Department has indicated that an individual child would legally be considered to be the child of an individual. The relationship between foster parent child and kinship carer child is captured in the context of parental responsibility rather than the term affinity. This is considered appropriate given that these relationships can be short to medium term and may cover many different individuals over a period of time, while kinship relationships can be difficult to determine in terms of the basis of the relationship. More generally, the issues of parental responsibility and affinity are two separate issues. So, Members' views on clauses 5 and 18 of the Bill in light of the additional information. Are members content? Okay. Clause 9, aggravation where the relevant child is involved. The committee ra raised two issues regarding Clause 9. Uh, in relation to the first, it was agreed to request further clarification of why in the Bill a child is not considered a victim in their own right, to what extent the proposed amendment being considered in conjunction with the Department of Health will address this, and if there were multiple children in a home, for example, four children, and each one was classed a victim in their own right under this legislation, would one incident result in an offence against the victim and an offence against each child under this clause, i.e. that there would be five separate offences? 
At our meeting on the 17th of September, the committee agreed that we were content with um, the further clarification provided by the Department and its correspondence dated the 16th of September, but we wish to see the text of the proposed amendment that is being considered in conjunction with the Department of Health. The Department has provided the text of the proposed amendment, which amends the Child Cruelty Offence in Section 20 of the Children and Young Persons Act 1968. It is New Clause 20A at Annex A of the Department's letter. The Department has outlined that this amendment will ensure that non-physical ill-treatment of a child by someone with parental responsibility for them is criminalised. It will also ensure that current references to an offence around unnecessary suffering or injury to a child explicitly state that this relates to the suffering or injury being of a physical or otherwise nature, again ensuring that non-physical behaviour is captured, and this should enable matters such as isolation, humiliation, etc. to be captured, assuming acceptance of the amendment, including by the Speaker, and this would make clear that it is an offence. The Department has indicated that the child cruelty offence only applies to those under the age of 16, and having uh, liaised with colleagues in the Department of Health, as well as colleagues in the police, the Department is not aware of similar child protection provisions that can be easily adjusted to explicitly deal with non-physical ill-treatment of those aged 16 and 17 in the context of a parent-child relationship. Uh, the Department would welcome the views of the Committee on reducing the age threshold for the, the parental responsibility exclusion from underage 18 to underage 16, which is clauses 11 and 17, in order, in order to ensure that non-physical abuse of 16 and 17 year olds in a parent-child relationship is clearly provided for in legislation. In the absence of this, there is the possibility that it may not be possible to address non-physical ill-treatment of those aged 16 and 17 in this context. And the Department has provided the text of this proposal, and it is in the Department's letter. There is a lot still to go through, Christine, here. It is all related. Okay. Bear with me, members. The Department has outlined that the standard offence uh, thresholds. Um, the Department has outlined that the standard offence thresholds would apply, in so far as any behaviour would have to be considered to be abusive, be viewed as such by a reasonable person, and occur on two or more occasions. The Department has also highlighted that the parental responsibility ex exclusion in England and Wales is also 16, uh, which it understands has not given rise to difficulties there, and it could be considered appropriate. Uh, in that it is linked to a range of age-specific permissions, for example, uh, the school leaving age, age at which a person can live on their own, ability to work in a licensed premise, getting married or joining the armed forces with parental consent. Furthermore, any decision to charge an individual with the offence would be dependent on the particular circumstances of the case, and the reasonable person defence would also apply. And the committee was also concerned that while there is an assumption in this clause that harm has been done, um, with the reference to seeing, hearing or being present um, during, that it is not specific or clear enough. Uh, noting the wording of Clause, 7, subsec or clause 5, subsection 5 of the Scottish legislation, which states that for it to be proved that the offence is so aggravated that there, there does not need to be evidence that a child had ever had any awareness of or understanding of A's behaviour or been adversely affected by A's behaviour, the committee believed that to ensure effective enforcement and prosecution, the wording of Clause 9 uh, needed to be strengthened to reflect this position uh, more clearly. The committee was of the view that this clause required amended uh, either by adopting Scottish wording, unless there is any specific reason not to use that wording, or wording that provides the same sort of clarity, and sought confirmation from the Department regarding whether the Minister is content to bring forward an amendment on this basis. The Committee also asked the Bill Clerk to prepare a draft amendment for consideration. At our, at our meeting on the 17th of September, the Committee noted the further clarification that had been provided by the Department in relation to this child aggravator offence, and the Department's view that an amendment akin to the Scottish legislation is not needed. The Committee also considered the text of the draft amendment prepared by the Bill Clerk and agreed to provide the wording of the potential amendment and request the views of the Department on whether there are any implications if it was added to the clause, what value it adds to the clause, and whether the Department would consider covering this in the explanatory and financial me memorandum to provide greater clarity. The Department has responded, highlighting uh, its previous advice that the child aggravation 
uh, locally is wider than the Scottish offence in that there is no requirement for a reasonable person to consider that the behaviour would adversely impact on a child or that the child has to live with either the victim or offender. The Scottish legislation provides that their offence is aggravated if a child sees, hears or is present. Uh, plus, a reasonable person would consider the behaviour to be likely to adversely affect a child. Proving the aggravation is then subject to a condition that for the offence to be aggravated, there does not need to be evidence that the child has been aware of, understood or been adversely affected by the abuse. The offence in the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill is aggravated on the basis of an objective fact, simply that the child sees, hears or was present. The first limb of the Scottish requirements. Turning purely on these facts, unlike the Scottish provision, which also requires a second limb of consideration of adverse effects, the clause does not raise the question of the child's awareness. The Department has expressed the view that the proposed committee amendment would therefore introduce an unrelated adverse effect provision, which is unnecessary and would add nothing to the clause, and could risk giving rise to confusion by casting doubt on the effectiveness of Clause 9. The Department has indicated it will not support the amendment. It has also stated that any text in the explanatory and financial referendum uh, memorandum uh, must reflect what is contained in the bill. So, members, your views on clause nine of the bill, um, including whether the committee is content to support the department's proposed amendment to the clause and the proposed amendment to clauses eleven and seventeen to reduce the age threshold for the parental responsibility exclusion from under age eighteen to under age sixteen, uh, in order to ensure that non-physical abuse of sixteen and seventeen-year-olds in a parent-child relationship is clearly provided for in legislation and whether the potential committee amendment is required in light of the further comments from the Department. Members, apologies for that lengthy track through all of our considerations and where we're at. Linda? I'm glad you've done it because we didn't, I didn't actually have time to go through it, so it was helpful to, to, to me, and even in terms of clarifying in our own heads where we're at. The, Absolutely, would support the reduction to the the sixteen and, and clause nine, eleven, and seventeen. Um, I think it was something we actually discussed previously as well as a committee, and um, so so I'd imagine it's not something we have a great challenge with. I think, and I suppose I'd want to hear from Rachel around this because it obviously was herself who suggested the amendment, and and I wasn't opposed to it. But I think, given the the explanation that the department have given. And even the conversation that we had at our previous committee meeting last week on, on the 17th, where I felt we were actually getting confused around the amendment and it concerned me that we were going, going down that road. And explanations that we had had also give me confidence that actually what was already there is maybe better than any amendment we would put forward. So I'm, I'm content that we don't amend it. But I would like to hear from Rachel, obviously, because it was, it was her proposal, and I don't want I suppose, just to throw it out the window without hearing from, from the person who proposed it. But just to, to put on record that I would be supportive of both reducing to 16 and keeping Clause 9 as it is. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Rachel, do you want to pick up on it? Hi. <laughs> Don't tell me. <laughs> the first point, just in terms of the age reduction, um, this for me changes the scope of the bill quite drastically. I'm wondering if there has been any conversations with stakeholders on this, like Nikki and the NSPCC, um, and does this does this sort of now say that domestic abuse offence? can be prosecuted against parents of 16 and 17 year olds? That would be certainly my first Veronica, question. Let's invite you in just to deal with that straight away. Okay. Um, in, in terms of the change that's being suggested there, it is only in the context of the child parental responsibility relationship. It isn't making any change in terms of the, the bill more generally, so it's, it's in relation to, to that specific element of it. But yes, as you say, the domestic abuse offence would then apply to parental child relationships for 16, 17-year-olds. I suppose the flip side of that is, in the absence of the reduction in the parental responsibility exclusion from underage 18 to underage 16, 
Our concern is that potentially non-physical abusive, non-physical ill treatment of a child that is non-physical abusive behaviour may not be sufficiently captured within other offences. Um, so that's the rationale why we're suggesting that that parental responsibility exclusion um, threshold is reduced down, but it doesn't affect kind of the provisions of the bill in relation to 16 and 17 year olds in other relationships. Okay. Okay. So just, it's just because it's obviously this is quite a different bit of a change in terms of parental responsibility and who that applies to. Um, so we are saying now that parents could be uh, uh, could be sort of done for a better word under this this offence if there was uh, uh, under the domestic abuse offence from for a 16 year old but not a 15 year old so recognising that abuse can be done to 16 and 17 year olds but not a 15 year old I suppose the rationale for that is that in our previous consideration of legislation we had felt that this was captured within it was adequately captured within child protection legislation so effectively that behaviour would be criminalised albeit in a different guise um, having discussed this further with colleagues in both um, police PPS um, and health um, it's now you know we have a clearer understanding that there is there are limitations there so as I say that's why that change is being brought forward but I suppose our, our appreciation previously had been that this was captured under child protection legislation previously so if a, an individual as a parent was abusing a child non-physically that that would have been captured under other provisions we now appreciate that it, it potentially doesn't um, so I suppose it's, it's shifting um, in, in terms of the criminalisation of it the, the, um, the, the type of legislation that's governing it if that makes sense Okay, and just just lastly on that, um, has there been any discussion with stakeholders, NSPCC, NICI, any of the Children Child Protection Organisation or Children Rights Organisation? On we haven't challenge? had discussions with them to date. Um, that was because we wanted to come and take the committee's views on this in the first instance, um, because obviously if the committee wasn't minded to follow that, we didn't want to have had those discussions with stakeholders, but certainly that's something that, that we would do subsequent to this, if the committee were agreeable. I'm more. I'm content to to progress that forward, but I would be very, would very much welcome input from those organisations that had been uh, had raised this. My, my my problem with this change is that I've had no time to consider it, and we haven't had any feedback. And to make that kind of a change in the absence of a consultative process that the committee engaged in to get feedback, a change of that nature. I don't feel is something that I would be able to support in the absence of having went through that process. The spirit behind it and what we're talking about, I certainly have sympathy for, but I just I would be wary about putting my hand up for something that I haven't been able to exhaustively test, um, just so that I, I, I know what the consequences of it would be. Rachel? Chair, just to come back on that, that's sort of what I'm saying in terms of content to progress that forward to look at what this actually means for the bill. Um, I'm mindful when the previous Attorney General was here, there was a discussion about parental responsibility in terms of protecting the child from nefarious activities. So, with the, pr the parental responsibility exclusion, would you have, you know, a 17-year-old restrict, you know, who has got cash restrictions because of parental responsibilities now being able to take parents to court over in, within this legislation? Just trying to make sure that that isn't covered, or, or, or what the what the consequences of this is, before um, I believe just because we got it last night, just to be able to make any any decisions on it. Okay, Paul. Yeah, just like yourselves, Chair, I think I will remain mute on the the, the age change because I, we have not had time to uh, consider it. Uh, you know, that's no fault of the department either because obviously they're. Thinking of these things through too, so I just think we need to be guarded in how we proceed with uh, giving the department the advice on that because we need to look at uh, it uh, more thoroughly. Uh, on the on the more specific issue around the child's awareness with regards to clause nine and the aggravation where a relevant child is involved, I think the confusion for me anyway last week was where we actually placed this amendment. I'm still of mind that we need this amendment, and I would like, I think, the department to explain to me how it could do, how it could lead to confusion, and how it could do damage, uh, and to the effectiveness of clause nine by adding it, 
Uh, because, because what I simply say, what I mean by that is where do we place it? We talked a lot last week about clause, uh, clause 9 to, to a 2, the made use of the child in directing behaviour at B. Now, when you look at the explanatory notes, what that basically explicitly means is that this could apply where the accused encourages or directs the child to spy on or report on the day-to-day -day activities of a partner. The involvement of the child could be unwittingly or unwillingly. So I get where that covers that piece. The, the child's been asked to, or, or told or forced to act something out. Uh, but where I think we need this amendment is actually in Clause 9 to a 1 the directed behaviour at the child. And when you look at the explanatory notes, that states that that section provides that the aggravation applies where it is shown that at any time in commissioning the offence, the accused directed behaviour at a child. And it goes in then to explain, this could include the accused threatening violence towards a child to control or frighten the partner connected person or being abu abusive towards the child. That's to me the essence of coercive control, whereby a perpetrator would only have to threaten to abuse or to hurt or to make witness the child to an offence against the victim, uh, to have a massive impact and effect on the victim uh, and to coerce that victim. And that's why I think we need something, either by way of an amendment or by it being explained in the explanatory note, that the child doesn't necessarily have to be aware of the perpetrator's behaviour or even to understand the nature of the perpetrator's behaviour or even be adversely affected by the perpetrator's behaviour, because they could be downstairs, upstairs, watching TV, sleeping, when that threat is implied to the victim. And that, that threat would probably only have to be made the once, but it could be repeated time and time again. And the child would have no consciousness of that threat being implied. And that's where I think we need it in writing. I'm not sure whether we need it and, and I would be worried that we would do damage to the bill. So that's why I'm leaving it open for the department to tell me, yeah, well, there might be some room here with regards to the explanatory note. But, you know, you, in the explanatory note, you do define or explain what effect a clause would have. So I just don't understand why we can't have an amendment like this that explicitly states that the child doesn't actually need to be aware or understand. I'll leave it there, Chair. Veronica? I suppose, again, that's coming back to the references to the child seeing, hearing or being present. So as we've noted in the letter, it's, it's in relation to those facts um, that consideration is, is being given to. If there wasn't an amendment in the bill, it probably wouldn't be appropriate to make reference to it in the expandary and financial memorandum. But it is perhaps something that we could look at in the context of the guidance that's associated with the domestic abuse offence and that's going to be done under Clause 25 more generally, but I suppose in, in terms of the, the position more generally, um, for both Clause 8 and Clause 9, it's, it's very much the aggravation is on that factual basis of see, hear or is present. So as long as the child sees, hears or is present, that aggravation could apply. And, and there, you know, it, it's turning on that fact as opposed to um, any provision in relation to the, the awareness more generally. Certainly, it's something that we could look at in, in, the, in the guidance, if, if that provides any reassurance. So, just on that, and thank you very much, Frank, for this. I, I really appreciate this engagement. Uh, but to me, to me, nine two B actually weakens what I'm trying to state with regards to the nature of coercive control, because then it is basically saying a child has to see, or hear, or be present during an instant of behaviour. When we know coercive control and the nature of it isn't necessarily like that. So that's why I think we need something stronger. And I think this amendment adds to that. Um, because we know that the perpetrator will be very sleek at, very secretive even, to the point where he will may well do things whereby those three 
those three requirements the child saw or heard or was present I suppose might, not, in, might not be captured? Yeah. I suppose in, in terms of those elements and the awareness provision, to us that awareness provision is almost it's supplementary to that initial requirement and, and how the aggravation would apply. Fully, fully appreciate where you're, you're coming from in relation to that, but I think it is coming back to the, you know, none of those conditions require the child to have been aware of, of what the behaviour may be. You know, for example, it, it could be a, a very, very young child that has been present at the time and, and the aggravation could still apply in that context. I fully appreciate in terms of controlling and course of behaviour more generally, um, you know, the, the extent to which that, that can apply in relation to children. Linda? Just on, on, on Paul's point, I thought we had kind of settled last week that the explanatory note, if the explanatory note was changed, and I know that probably was, was the Chair's view, because we were all getting confused around the amendment, and, and if it was confusing us, then I think it would confuse anybody else, to be fair, because we were looking at this stuff day and daily. So that, that was my reason. I, I thought that the explanatory note could have been changed, and the points that Paul are making are exactly my concerns. If, and if the explanatory note cannot be changed, then in that instance, we may well have to go back to looking at an amendment because it w I wouldn't be content that it's only in the guidance, to be honest with you, just because of the importance of this. And I think it's getting back to, and I've used the example in, in previous meetings, I'm just going to use the same one again for, for ease, but in terms of the, the heart case, mm -hmm. I mean, a, a, on one occasion, the father brought peanuts into the home because one of the children had a, a nut allergy. Now, the child didn't have to be in the room or even in the house, but the, the impl implication was, I will harm the children by causing a potentially life-threatening injury to one of them. Th there was nothing said in terms of that. The child, as I say, may not have been in the house whenever they were brought into the home, but the, but the, the child was actually being used mm -hmm. in that circumstance in terms of coercive control so that those that's the kind of circumstance that Paul's talking about and the, I'm sure we could, we could quote millions of examples I'm just quoting that one because it's yeah. on record and it's a case that people are if it's are, helpful we can certainly about. look at the text that's in the explanatory memorandum at the moment and see what further clarification we can provide in relation to that to try and deal with with this issue if, if that would be helpful. I, mean, I, I think it would be good if it's done on the explanatory note, but if it can't be, I would be concerned then that... that I suppose typically, I, I suppose where I was coming from in, in terms of not being able to deal with it in the explanatory note is that if you don't have, if you don't have a clause there, your explanatory note wouldn't refer to it, if that makes sense. But certainly we could look and see how in the context of 9.2 in relation to the sees, hears or is present, what further clarification we can provide in relation to that bit of the clause in terms of this issue more generally to try and deal with the, the concerns that are being raised, you if, see, if that think, makes sense. No, I actually think the explanatory note would be around 9 to A2 in relation to the, the kind of the issues that, that Paul and I are talking about because it's making use of the child. That means that the child may know nothing about it and it's not just making use of them in the in the terms in which are, that are already there around the, the span or the given information on a parent or anything like that. Making use of a child is the implied threat of the harm I will do to a child if you don't behave in a certain way or if you don't go along with But I'll, I'll, yeah. I mean, Paul can speak for So himself. that's where I think I get confused last week because uh, 2A2 is a made use of the child and the explanatory note actually talks about the child being used, mm -hmm. whereas in 2A1, it's a directed behaviour at a child, at the child, which is different. So that's to me the threat to harm the child, the directed behaviour at the child. So I think it actually sits better in 2A1. Uh, but again, then it's the 2B that basically says the child saw or heard. I think it's the 2B that actually does the damage for me. It actually doesn't give me any reassurance whatsoever. And that's where even in the explanatory notes, whether it's to clarify 2B, that would be helpful, but it would also, I think, could be added at 2A1, uh, where, it say, where it states that this could include a, an accused uh, threatening violence towards a child to control or frighten a partner, a connected person, or being abusive towards the child. And then at the end of that, you could add, uh, even if the child has not been aware 
or, or understand or understanding of the nature of A's behaviour. So, uh, to me, it can fall in either of those two places, just to clarify the whole of Clause 9. But I, I do think it's required. I suppose the question I still pose to the Department is, how do they see that this would do damage in, in either conf confusion, creating confusion or casting doubt on the effectiveness of 9? How would that actually work? I suppose we feel by bringing in... You're bringing in a provision into the bill which... Because it's you know because of the the nature and way the way in which it's constructed, we don't have a provision akin to the Scottish one where you have a reasonable person would consider that the child is aware of, and their element that amendment that is being put forward in the Scottish bill is on foot of that earlier element in their bill, if you know what I mean. So they have a bit prior to the awareness amendment that we're talking about the, the two being connected. We don't have that element in our bill. So therefore, it's considered that that additional bit is unnecessary. Certainly, we can have further discussions with council in terms of is there something further that we could um, cover in the explanatory note which might provide further clarification in relation to this, if, if that's helpful. I, I still think, and I'll, I'll lay it on the line here, I still think that the explanatory note is a second best option. And I, do, I would rather see something on the face of the bill. But if, 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 if you can convince me that the explanatory note is the place for it to be, then so be it. But I'm still of the mind that we really want to try and amend the legislation itself. I'll leave it there, Chair. Um, Sinead Bradley and then Rachel. Thank you, Chair. Um, just on, on those two points, um, yes, I, you know, we have gone round on this, I think, um, in terms of whether it should be in the face of the bill, whether that filters it, and then the explanatory note. And I did, I did believe we were actually looking at a change in the explanatory note, which I don't really see. So there is clearly still a piece of work there to be done. Um, in terms of the age, Reduction, my my understanding of this, and you know, I stand to be corrected on it, that the reduction in age basically is the meeting point where other legislation, you know, if, if we say, oh, well, this bill wouldn't um, service children of that age, but by redu a reduction in the age, we actually create a further net to safeguard that. 17 and 18 year old um, that doesn't exist. But I, I do think the wise way to go forward in this is, as has been suggested, is to spe um, have conversations with Nikki and all those stakeholders who would specifically look at that age profile. Um, because I might think enough of it is not clear enough to be able to give an assertion at this time. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chair. I know, um, appreciate that we have had long conversations about this and uh, apologies but okay. <laughs> i i'm going to put in a bit of a curveball here what if we remove the child needing to see here yeah. or is present during an incident and replace it with a reasonable person test because that could refer just to try and and, and, and tease that out if there is a victim, say, with a dependent child suffering from economic abuse or financial abuse, which is obviously in this bill, leading to a financial strain and uh, an inability to provide for the child, for example, furthermore than psychological abuse or course of control, that's obviously in this bill where the child has never witnessed behaviour, such as the financial abuse or the course of control, but the effects on the victim have had a knock-on effects to the child, a reasonable person would assume that adverse effects have been had on the child. There's no requirement for the child to see, here or be present, but a reasonable person would, could say that domestic abuse has occurred against B by A and that B aggravated under nine. So apologies, that's another way. No. Rather than adding something in, as it is in Scotland, and I appreciate that there are some additional hoops to jump through in the Scottish Act when the, he sees here or is present during an incident, plus the reasonable person would consider the abuse. But if we remove the sees here or is present and just talked about the reasonable person test, which is not in ours, could that cover all of the issues that we're batting back and forth here? Well, just on that, that, that's a very natural progression of thought process in this. Because I've always said, even last week, I have a problem with two 
9-2-B. B. Because it basically, I think, so if you read 9-1, it basically says that the offence is aggravated by reason of involving a relevant child. And then we go down to 9 to b and that actually clarifies what they actually, and restricts that the child saw or heard or was present during. It's, to me, that's the damaging bit here. To me, that's the, pro the bit I have the problem with, which then sought me out an amendment to try and fix that or strengthen that. So that's... That, Say that's not a curveball, that's just a natural progression of thought progress, to be honest with you. And I'm I'm probably there with Rachel. If we can't if we can't if we can't insert the the what I call the awareness and understanding test on the child, if we can't insert that into the bill, then I think the next logical step is to remove the bit that I have a problem with, which is the child saw or heard or was present. I'll, I'll I'll get Veronica's view in that in a moment. I want to understand, Paul, your position and Rachel's as to why this needs to be in. Give me the, give me the scenario that requires this, because I'm not convinced, I'll be honest. You know, my position is I entirely agree with the department on this. So explain to me why this needs to be in. So we'll use Linda's uh, scenario, uh, and that scenario paints the picture that the child doesn't need to see or hear or be present. I also use Rachel's uh, example with regards to the financial aspect uh, that child does not need to be need to see or hear or be present and then I use my my example whereby the perpetrator threatens to rape and this is very harsh the, the perpetrator threatens to rape the victim in front of a child which we have we've heard of before that's horrendous but the child doesn't need to see, hear, or be present when that threat is implied. And that threat will last a lifetime. Uh, and, and I don't see that we've sufficiently covered that threat, or any of the, th the scenarios that we've painted, with when you have a clause like 9-2-B. So to me, it's the damage that 9-2-B does that could well... All of those three scenarios that I've painted, that, 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 could, that could hurt that case with having 9 to be in. Veronica. I suppose our, our concern in relation to the removal of 9 to be would be you're removing a provision that the only condition is essentially that the child is somewhere, the child sees it, the child hears it, or the child is present um, for it. So it could be something that's very, very indirect. It isn't obvious, but it's very, very controlling, very, very coercive behaviour and has a, a severe impact in relation to um, the partner or family member in question. Um, so I think the removal of that provision would de significantly detrimentally impact in terms of those types of situations where the child may not necessarily be aware of, of what's going on. I suppose the, the other concern would be in relation to th the removal of that and a substitution with the awareness provision um, would be coming back to... Um, that condition being a reasonable person would consider that that would adversely impact on the child. Obviously, if you have very um, explicit or obvious physical behaviour or non-physical behaviour, you know, it, it could be made out that that would adversely impact on the child. I think there is, though, go, because of the nature of controlling and coercive behaviour, emotional abuse, financial abuse, etc., etc., whether or not you would be able to sufficiently argue that it could be considered, and I suppose it's coming back to that, that, that wording, that it would actually adversely impact on the child. A lot of the behaviours, that may not necessarily be obvious. Yeah, but Chair, remember, this is, Clause 9 is all about the aggravation of the crime. It's not about the, chi it's not about the crime to the child. Mm -hmm. It's about the aggravation. Um, but for the aggravation to apply, the reasonable person would have to consider that it would adversely impact on that child. No, I disagree completely on that. Because it's how it would affect the victim, not the child. And I, and I think that's where the aggravation should be. It's how it impacts on the victim, uh, which is always named as B. Um, and that's why, if, if you read 9, 9 1, it may be specified as an allegation alongside a charge of the domestic abuse offence 
against the person A that the offence is aggravated by reason of involving a relevant child. Full stop. Leave it there. And then you go on. For the purposes of subsection 1, the domestic abuse offence is aggravated by reason of involving a relevant child if, at any time in the commission of the offence, a directed behaviour a direct behaviour at the child or the made use of the child in directing behaviour at B. End of. Leave it there. I don't know why we have to add in that the child saw or heard or was present. And, and so that's why I, I really have a problem with 9 to b And because of that, I've, we've sought to clarify that with an amendment that makes, which gives an awareness and understanding test to the child that they don't need to have awareness or understanding. And I just think Whilst we include 9 to b in this, I think we need the awareness and understanding of the child to be addressed. So that's where I'm at, because it's all about the aggravation in Clause 9, not the actual crime against the child. Veronica, do you want to come back on that? I suppose in, in terms of the two scenarios that are being put forward, in terms of remove um, 9 to b as I say, we would have significant concerns with the removal of 92B, given the types of scenarios that it covers. But you know, there is a separate issue of whether or not we agree with the amendment that was proposed by the committee. As we've set out, we don't consider that's necessary. But I, I, I would be of the view to remove 92B and replace with the amendment, as opposed to have 92B and have the amendment. The removal of 92B, I, I, I consider, would have significant implications in terms of the, the types of cases that could be brought forward where it would be aggravated by virtue of, and again, coming back to the fact that aggravation is simply the fact that the child has been there. There doesn't have to be any impact on the child. The child doesn't have to be aware of it. It is simply turning on the fact the child saw, heard, or was present um, in those scenarios where the child has been basically present for that abuse. Um, as I say, we, we would have significant concerns about so B being Paul removed. Makes, just so I can clear this up, he's saying that it should only be about the victim. The offence and, and the charge taken is the, the offence against the victim. The aggravation the is aggravation in relation is to the, the child. child is involved. So yeah. there is already the very fact of what we're proposing here in this legislation is we're creating a new offence as to what has been done to the victim. If, you want, if you're going to add additional penalty or so on because it relates solely to the victim, then increase the penalty. But the aggravation here is the different factors, and that's the child. That, that, I'm just trying to get my head when, when you said, Paul, it's about the victim. Yeah, nine is simply the aggravation in relation. It's an additional factor to take yeah, into account. Because I suppose almost in a sense, the ag it's not that they're separate, but effectively you have your domestic abuse offence in and of its own right, and you have the aggravation. And the aggravation, the focus on that is how can we increase the sentencing yeah. effectively in relation to the, the underpinning domestic abuse offence because there has been the involvement in a child, of a child in a range of guises. Yeah. So yes, the focus of the aggravator is the linkage with the child. Yeah. And, and, and the child here doesn't need to be aware of it, it just needs to... It That's just needs to drafted. be there, and, and I suppose that was really why we didn't incorporate that element of, you know, we, we did consider at the outset the, the Scottish provisions and the changes that were, were made, um, but we were keen to have an aggravator which was effectively, because there is a child there present, you know, in that kind of um, situation, that in and of itself is sufficient on our mind for consideration to be given by the court to increase the sentencing that... Um, may otherwise have been attributable for that offence. We, we are of the view that the Scottish provisions are more limiting than ours, in that you have to bring in the reasonable person aspect. Yeah. And the awareness. Yeah. Linda? The more we talk, the more I'm going back to the explanatory note, but I'm going to completely confuse issues now, <laughs> fuse the issue now, and go back to the first point, around, j just quickly, around the 16, 17-year-old. The point that you're making around, you know, that that the child could be could take their parent for financial abuse. Um, I don't think is right because this is in clause nine. It's only around an aggravating factor, so it's not actually that doesn't it, it, it potentially is different in, in the other clauses, but not not in that one. So I think that we probably would have less concerns about that, given that that's the fact. And I actually think it needs to be in there for that reason, because the 16, 17-year-old should not be 
let, you know, they should not be considered an adult if they're still living in the home and could still potentially be used against their parent in whatever form, whether it's... And I suppose by way of clarification in terms of the parental <coughs> responsibility exclusion and the change in that age, we're not suggesting that there's any change in relation to the, um, the, the aggravating factors for that very reason, you know, and the fact yeah. that by and large we consider children to be under the age of 18. Yeah. So I, I think that on that point we should have less concerns, but I, I just wanted to, to throw that out there for, for the other members who, who had concerns around it. I, I keep coming back to, to changing the explanatory note, and, and I'm not actually, I'm, I'm not precious about whether it's changed in 9A1 or 9A2, 9A2A1 or 9A2A2, this gets very confusing, um, but I, I do, I would really like that somewhere there in the explanatory note that it states that the implication, you know, that the use of a child around implied hurt or injury and whatever way, wording and it, I don't know what the wording would be around that and Stephanie would be probably the better person to come in on that and that's actually what I was going to say Chair. could Stephanie come in and give us an idea if, if, if the explanatory could be changed there would that is that possible and is that something that could work in your view and I know that's obviously the department has, has a view but we, we, we can bring Stephanie in but Stephanie's contribution is always done in closed session yeah. okay. so Oh, sorry. Apologies. You're okay. Um, you want us to step out? No, no, because we're <laughs> no, no, let, let's deal <laughs> with. Want to get through let, it? Let, let's deal with this. Um, you, you give the reason that the explanatory financial memorandum always follows what's in the legislation. So I take that point. You can't put something into an EFM which isn't in legislation. Committee needs to decide. Does it want to change the legislation? And then it'll naturally flow. It goes into the EFM. I don't think it's for me. The solution here, not not the solution, because I think some members have a view of what needs to be in it, and others are differing. But um, the only area where the awareness issue comes into play, if we don't change the amendment, is in the guidance. I don't personally feel that an EFM can flow and accommodate members' views if we don't actually introduce an amendment to legislation. Um, so if there's going to be an, this addressed. Outside of legislation, I suspect at best it's going to be the guidance will make it clear when it comes to the awareness issue what the committee is trying to convey. Could um, you add the reasonable person and not remove? Would that be a potential wrong? Well, I suppose that's coming back to what the original suggestion was, and, and again, our view that we don't think that provision is needed because we don't have the two limbs that Scotland have. There would obviously be nothing to stop either the committee or a member, mm -hmm. um, but, but from a, a departmental perspective, that would be our view. <coughs> okay, members. Chair, the, the, the least I would be expecting is a change in the explanatory notes. I will not. I will not take the department on face value with regards to what's included in the guidance. If we're going to go down that road, we can always put an amendment into the bill to say that the guidance should include something. And we don't want to go there. <laughs> you might. <laughs> but it's I, I'm not, I suppose, necessarily directing at the department that they wouldn't put it in because I, I I'll I'll be less cynical and say I think that in fairness that if the committee directed that we really thought it was important, you might. It's just that guidance is only guidance and that's where where I become concerned. It's, it's how it then plays out at the other end. Yep. You know, can... Chair, just to confirm it, I wasn't suggesting that remove 92B complete, you know, and, and not replace it with mm -hmm. anything. It was if 92B is the sticking point, could that be replaced with the reasonable person test to cover all of these aspects that we're talking about? But it wasn't a direct removal without something else going in. I, again, I take the point about the reasonable person test that um, the Scottish model is a. Is a Poorer version of what this bill is trying to do. So what? That, that's my. I accept the argument that the department is putting forward. That's my personal view on it. Um, and and therefore, why would it be necessary? But listen, members are going to have to come to a view on it now because we have debated this at length week after week. Um, and at some point, you've got to decide what are you going to do on it. 
um, and, and whose opinion are you going to take as the one that you, you feel that you should flow with. I take the view that this is a, an aggravating factor where a child has been involved and uh, based on it being an aggravating factor where a child is involved that this bill as drafted doesn't require awareness to be an issue and to put in an amendment to say that just creates unnecessary legislation. Can I add to that? It actually does mention in explanatory notes in one place that the child doesn't need to be, uh, could be unwittingly or unwillingly. And that's the explanatory note on subsection 2A2. So if it's good enough for it to be there and it's not going to do violence to the bill, why would it do violence to the bill or a clause 9 somewhere else? by including it somewhere else. And the very fact that you've included it in section 2A2, but not in 2A1, is enough to worry me. So even if that line... If it helps the committee, we can certainly speak to Legislative Council in terms of... If, if Paul, if you're saying an, an apology, I can't recall, even though we have, have written it. If there's reference to that in 92A2, we can certainly ask the question of Council in terms of could a similar sentence be included in relation to um, 9.2b, if, if that is, is helpful. Yeah, yeah that, that to me would be... I, I don't think that it's not in the legislation. I just think that somebody's looked at it and decided what made use of or what directed at means. And so look at it again, given all the examples that have been given here, would be my view and change the explanation. Certainly, as we say, 9.2b is simply the sees here or is present. And by virtue of that, the child doesn't need to be aware so if you know that sentence could probably, and, and we look at the sentence that is in 92A2, that sentence could potentially be replicated in 92B as well. But as I say, we'll have discussions I, with Legislative Council in yeah, relation or, or to sorry, that. Sorry, 92A1. Two, two A1. A1. Uh, okay. It's where yeah. I think. So it's at the minute it's in 92A2, but it's not in 92A1, and I just don't understand why it wouldn't be in. 9 to A1, whenever the directed behaviour at the child is where it needs to be unwitting, unwittingly and you know, unaware of. Uh, so it's nearly as if... The, so you're the, saying there's a reference in relation to 9 to A2? Yeah. Yes, But you is. essentially think it should be covering 9 to A generally? Yes, so that last so we will, sentence... We will certainly have that conversation with Council. Yeah, the last sentence on that paragraph, subsection 2A2, it states the involvement of the child could be unwittingly or unwillingly. And it ends there, full stop. Now, myself. If Paul has provided a solution, I'll give a hearty amen to that. <laughs> I can support it. Certainly we will look at that and, and, and do what we can do. Okay. Um, we're doing the formal clause by clause next week, so no pressure. Um, okay, then the other aspect is this around the section 20 of the Children and Young Person Act 1998 to do with that proposed amendment that's been worked up with health reference in it the department's letter is where you'll find the proposed text Christine do you just want to remind us on this issue again for members benefit um, yes, this, the wording has been provided at, um, it's in the departmental letter dated the 23rd of September, um, and it uh, provides the wording of a proposed um, new clause that amends the Children and Young Persons Act, uh, Northern Ireland, 1968. Um, so it's really whether the committee is content um, or has any further questions on that proposed amendment. The department's highlighting that it will ensure that non-physical ill treatment of a child by someone with parental responsi responsibility for them is criminalised. Um, it will also ensure that current references to an offence around unnecessary suffering or injury to a child explicitly state that this relates to the suffering or injury being of a physical or otherwise nature again ensuring that non-physical behaviour is captured and this should enable matters such as isolation, humiliation, um, etc. to be captured and assuming acceptance of the amendment including by the Speaker this would make clear that it, that it is an offence. However, then the Department has also highlighted the issue that was covered earlier about that this amendment would only um, cover 
um, sorry, it only applies to those under the age of 16. Um, and then the department has put forward um, a proposal regarding changing the age um, to ensure that non-physical abuse of 16 and 17 year olds in a parent-child relationship is clearly provided for in legislation. We put forward those amendments to clauses 11 and 17. So it's whether the committee has any views on on that specific clause that it would apply to um, child, child cruelty offence for those under the age of 16 and then and or whether and I think from views expressed you need more time to consider an issue. The, yeah. the other issue so it's yeah. whether you have anything further you want to ask the departmental officials on these proposals or whether you just need more time to consider is the issue here that we the the issue around the child cruelty is needed, but it creates this consequence that you're flagging up as the concern? Yeah. Essentially, right? you wouldn't have this issue if the child cruelty offence applied to those under the age of 18. But essentially, because it's only applying to under 16s, it's leaving less protection for 16 and 17 year olds. Um, and, and while we fully appreciate the concerns in terms of the reduction of the parental responsibility exclusion and the potential in relation to um, parental responsibility. As I say, the flip side of that is if we don't reduce the parental responsibility exclusion threshold, there are lesser protections available in relation to 16 and 17 year olds, albeit that, as I say, we fully appreciate the concerns in terms of that coming under the auspices of the domestic abuse offence as opposed to child protection legislation. No, notwithstanding the the dilemma it creates in that respect, you'd still want to go with yes. this amendment um, uh, and then we would need to decide if you wanted to address the, the non-physical abuse for 16 and 17 year olds. And I suppose the difficulty in that context is because of the scope of the bill, you're straying into child protection provisions. While we're doing this amendment, there's a linkage in with the child aggravator with the child aspect. We wouldn't be able to do something material from a child protection perspective through this bill. So I, I suppose that's why, um, you know, part of the reason why we're, we're looking at this as well is, is to try and ensure as much coverage as possible. Okay. Paul? Yeah, I think we also already see Linda. what's... Sorry, then they're going ahead. Sorry, isn't they? I was just looking at a point of clarity. So really what you're saying, Veronica, is if we, if we don't change it from 18 to 16 in this bill, we can't put something else in because of the scope of the bill to protect that, that age group? Yeah, that would be my view. Obviously, it, it would be a matter for the right. Speaker, but given that we're dealing with domestic abuse offence and family proceedings, this is this is strength. It, it, it is definitively, you know, it, it's in health territory. It's it's not justice territory. Yeah, Paul. Just, just Paul. The, the only point, and again, I'm still mute on the age thing because I just haven't enough time to consider it. But we also, I think, need to see exactly what's been repealed from the 68 Act. Uh, we've got the we've got the wording of the new clause, which states that the wordings from including. To I think the word including to derangement are appealed, but we don't actually know all the wording in between. I don't. I should have brought that provision with me, but from memory, it's it's dealing with examples of non-physical um, ill treatment. So there are three or four references, as I say, to mental derangement um, and, and a number of other terms. And it's therefore considered, because we're basically saying physical or otherwise, we're doing physical plus anything that's non-physical. Essentially, the terminology that was referenced there by way of examples is no longer needed. You could still include it, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's not necessary to have it there. Okay, so if I can separate this in two parts, are members content with the amendment that has been put forward that deals with the cruelty aspect um, in terms of the wording of that and what it's trying to achieve? Okay, then the issue we need to look at is whether or not we want to pursue the non-physical for 16, 17-year-olds. Um, Chair, I, I was mute there because I'm not satisfied because we have just haven't enough time to look at it. Yeah. Too late. You know, that's... If it's helpful, we can share the, the extract from the letter to the committee in relation to that with Nikki and NSPCC and ask them if you can come back with some views in relation to that ahead of the committee meeting next week. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, members, I'm just keen to, to, to tease this one out because there's a print, there's a, a kind of procedural issue for me, irrespective of getting that response back next week because of the change it's talked about that we didn't go out and seek views on it and so on. I appreciate when you come to amendments, we're not doing that either. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult issue. I I think I'm going to have with, with what's being talked about. We're doing the formal clause by clause next week, Christine. Yeah. So, is there a, amendments on, on trying to achieve this for the 16 and 17 year olds? Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. yeah, the amendment is simply replacing 18 with 16. It's a, it, it's right, okay. a, a simple amendment. Okay. There, there's, there's nothing more to it than that. Okay. If the committee doesn't feel it has had the time to look at the amendment, it doesn't, can simply note it, it doesn't have to reach a decision on it. Okay, members, well, um, so that we just know for next week what it is that we're doing on this aspect. The amendment will be there, but members should decide in advance of that in the absence of the feedback. If we get it, we get it. Um, but it's difficult for a committee report to have deliberated the way it should have, in my opinion, for it to be a committee considered position. Maybe it's a department amendment that they bring in and they explain it in the floor of the House and procedurally then that's a more appropriate way in my view that you then vote for it. Um, okay, Christine, is there any other element in this section that needs to be clarified? Um, no way await the department coming back with possible amendment wording for next week. Relation to clause nine and yeah. the unwittingly comment. So as I said, we'll have discussions with council in relation to that, and we'll also see if we can get um, views from NSPCC and Nicky, um, with a view to having that with the committee for their session next week. Okay, but and members are content then with the proposed amendment that's been worked up with health on cruelty. Just before they go, because this is very important, because we don't want to waste anybody's time, but. That sentence, when you read it, the involvement of a child could be unwittingly or unwillingly. Now, does that refer to the child, or does that refer to either perpetrator or victim? That's something we need to clarify too, just in the wording as it sits. Without having the wording in front of me, Paul, I would it would be the child. Right. Okay. Would be would be my recollection. Where are we? You know, so basically, the child knows that while the child is involved in the abusive behaviour, the child effectively knows nothing about it. Yep. Yeah, okay. Okay. Clause 13 then, the alternative available for conviction. The committee had requested further information and detail from the department on why Clause 13 is necessary, how it would work in practice, including the provision of a scenario or example illustrating this, and what the implications would be if it was removed from the bill. The committee was also concerned that the wording of the clause does not clearly reflect the explanation of the purpose of the clause provided by departmental officials and asked the department to reflect on how the wording of the clause could be changed or enhanced to better reflect its purpose. At our meeting on the 17th of September, the committee considered the further information provided by the department and noted that it would amend the explanatory and financial memorandum to include the scenario as an example. Uh, and will also include this in the guidance which is being produced on the new offence. The committee agreed that in light of the further information and action to be taken by the department, it is content with clause 13 as drafted. The committee also agreed to request further information on the burden of proof, evidential test required to meet the test of personal connection. The department has outlined further information on this in its letter dated the 23rd of September, which members have. So members, that information is there for you to note, unless there's any other points members are wanting to make in respect of clause 13. No. Clause just, that, just that that's clarified a good lot of the stuff that I was concerned about. So. Sorry, Paul. That's clarified a lot of the stuff that I had been concerned about. Okay, thank you. Clause 22. 
around special measures. At our meeting on the 10th of September, the committee agreed to request confirmation that it is the department's intention to adopt the recommendation of women's aid and the recommendation in the Gillen Review regarding a guarantee of special measures in the Family Court. At the meeting on the 17th of September, the committee noted the additional information provided by the department and agreed to consider this clause further when the wording of the department's proposed amendment to require court rules to make specific provision in relation to special measures in family and civil proceedings for victims of domestic abuse and other offences was available. The uh, department has provided the text of the draft amendments uh, there are new clauses 26A and 26C at Annex A of the Department's letter. The Department had previously indicated that the court rules will make provision so that victims of domestic abuse are automatically eligible for consideration of special measures in family and civil proceedings. It will be for the court hearing the proceedings to determine whether it is necessary to make a direction for special measures in an individual case. The Department also outlined in its correspondence dated 9th of September its intention with the agreement of the Department of Finance to amend Article 12A of the Children in Northern <coughs> Ireland Order 1995 so that a court considering an application for a contact or residency order will be, specifically, uh, will be specifically required to have regard to the conviction of the party applying for the order for the new domestic abuse offence where the child aggravator has been applied. The Department has provided the text of this proposed amendment and it is found in pages 126 to 128. So, members, your views on clause 22 of the bill, and whether the committee is now content to support the department's proposed amendments that require court rules to make specific provision in relation to special measures in family and civil proceedings for victims of domestic abuse and other offences, and/or the proposed amendment to Article 12A of the Children Northern Ireland Order 1995. Members, content. Content. Clause 25, guidance on domestic abuse. At our meeting on the 10th of September, the committee agreed that it wants uh, 25 one change from May to either will or must in relation to provision of guidance by the department. It agreed uh, and agreed to ask the department for confirmation regarding whether the minister was content to bring forward such an amendment. The committee also asked the bill clerk to prepare a draft amendment. At our meeting on the 17th of September, the committee noted the minister had agreed to table an amendment to change the word May to must in clause 25 and the Department was instructing Council to draft the amendment. The Committee also considered that draft amendments prepared by the Bill Clerk and agreed to provide its preferred, preferred wording for amendment to the Department. The Department has provided alternative wording that would amend both subsection 1 and subsection 3. The proposed amendment provides that the Department must issue guidance on part 1 of the Bill and such other matters as it considers appropriate. Uh, keep the guidance under review and revise it if it considers revision necessary in light of the review. This ensures that the change requested for by the committee is dealt with in both parts of the clause as appropriate. The Department has also highlighted that given the duty imposed, uh, the Interpretation Act of Northern Ireland 1954 automatically requires the guidance to be revised from time to time as the occasion requires uh, in the absence of this. The text of the amendment can be found in the Department's letter. So if members are content to support the Department proposed amendment to Clause 25. Content. Mm -hmm. yeah. Clause 26, Prohibition of Cross-Examination in Person. At our meeting on the 10th of September, the Committee agreed to request confirmation that it is the Department's intention to adopt the recommendation of Women's Aid in relation to an automatic uh, prohibition of cross-examination in any family proceedings where there are allegations of domestic abuse or whether the perpetrator has admitted to domestic abuse and the recommendations in the Gillen Review relevant to court proceedings in domestic abuse cases. At the meeting on the 17th of September, the Committee noted the additional information that had been provided by the Department, which confirmed that in relation to the recommendation of women's aid provision has already been made in the Bill for an automatic prohibition to apply. Uh, where there is other specified evidence of domestic abuse. The other types of evidence of domestic abuse will be specified in regulations that the department, the department will consult on. In cases where an automatic prohibition does not apply, a court will have a discretionary power to prohibit cross-examination in person. The committee agreed to consider this clause further when the wording of the proposed amendment to require court rules to provide for a court hearing uh, civil proceedings to have a discretionary power to prohibit cross-examination in person, together with a proposed minor amendment to require a court considering whether to exercise its discretionary power to prohibit 
cross-examination in person to have regard to findings of fact made in civil or criminal proceedings as well as family proceedings. The Department has provided the text of the draft amendment. It is new clause 26B uh, at Annex A of the Department's letter. And the Department has also drawn the attention of the Committee to a small error in relation to Clause 26 that occurred while the Bill was being processed prior to inter its introduction and has provided the text of an amendment to correct this. This draft amendment is at Annex A of the Department's letter. So, Members, your views on Clause 26 of the Bill. If you are content to support the Department's proposed amendment that require court rules to provide for a court hearing, civil proceedings to have the discretionary power to prohibit cross-examination in person and to require a court considering whether to exercise its discretionary power to prohibit cross-examination uh, in person to have regard to findings of fact made in civil or criminal proceedings as well as family proceedings and or the amendment to correct the processing error that has occurred. Members are content. The Department has advised of three other minor and somewhat technical drafting amendments to Clause 8, Clause 10 and Clause 13 that the Department intends to bring forward. and They do not make any policy change. And the amendments to Clauses 8 and 10 tidy a small aspect of the wording in each place, particularly to reflect the position that the course of behaviour under the main offence is not the sole element of the domestic abuse offence. The amendment to Clause 13, which deals with an alternative offence as to the domestic abuse offence, would insert provision for the avoidance of doubt as to reflect the Criminal Law Act 1967, which contains general provisions for alternative verdicts and indictment proceedings. This is to make sure that there is no risk of implying that the provisions in the 67 Act are ousted by what is contained in Clause 13. The Department has provided the text of the proposed amendments, which are found in the Department's letter. Um, so members are asked to note the three proposed minor technical amendments unless there is further information required from members. Noted. The formal questions um, on them will be put during the formal clause by clause. So members, that concludes the, the informal consideration. Um, next week in the bill from the Department. We will be doing the formal clause, notwithstanding the area on Clause 9 um, that we are going to, to have an update on, and Clauses 11 and 17, which deal with the 16 and 17-year-old issue. That will have some further information for that meeting. So can I thank the department officials for being here and, you. and your advice on this? Thank you. Okay, members, just. A few more updates on this aspect. At our meeting on the 3rd of September, the committee agreed to request clarity from the PSNI on the rationale for following the National Police Chief's Council guidance on the approach to sharing information with the Home Office where a victim or witness of crime is also a suspected uh, immigration offender in the context of domestic abuse. The committee agreed to request the views of the Policing Board on the matter. PSNI and Police uh, board have responded that correspondence is in the table pack. The police stated that it ordinarily uh, adopts NPCC guidance in order to ensure where possible. It applies the same policing operating principles as GB colleagues. It also outlines the legal obligations to share such information when it comes to light, but highlights the NPCC guidance also states that immigration rules do allow for a victim of domestic violence to apply independently of their spouse for indefinite leave to remain before the end of the minimum period if they can produce evidence that the relationship broke down as a result of domestic violence. It explains that it encourages all victims of domestic abuse to report it to the police, and their primary concern will be to safeguard them and, where the evidence exists, bring offenders to justice. The Policing Board has advised that it does not consider the matter previously. It will consider the PSNI response at its meeting on the 1st of October and will advise if any issues arise. So that information is there for members to note. I know some members have asked for information in respect of that. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, members. Um, other issues not currently covered in the bill, then, in terms of uh, amendments and so on that we've been dealing with. Uh, the committee discussed the range of other issues related, raised in the evidence received that are not currently covered by the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill at our meeting on the 17th of September. Requested additional information from the Department of Justice and Communities on some of them. The committee also identified a range of issues that it wished to discuss further with the bill clerk, uh, Stephanie Mallon, to inform decisions on whether amendments should be brought forward to make legislative provision for some or all in the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. And these discussions took place at the meetings on the 17th of September and the 21st of September. Uh, additional information has been provided by the Department, and those responses are in the tabled pack. Uh, most of the information uh, will inform dis uh, the discussions relating to potential amendments. The Department uh, has responded to the assertion uh, by the Children's Law Centre that the equality screening undertaken as part of the consultation on the policy proposals in 2015-16 uh, no longer stands, given that clauses 11 and 17 now exclude many under-18s, and the Department is required to carry out an equality screening exercise, a full impact assessment consultation and proposed and propose mitigation, otherwise it will have breached Section 75 duty. The Department has stated that the provisions in the Bill were re-screened prior to the Bill's introduction to the Assembly in March. Uh, this re-screening exercise noted that the Department did not intend uh, that the new offence would include parental abuse or neglect, as this falls under child protection provisions, but that the new offence and other provisions would apply and be accessible equally to all groups individuals. Uh, this would include, for example, a person under 18 being abused by a sibling as well as abuse within teenage relationships. It was therefore considered that there was no evidence to indicate that under 18s would be adversely affected by the provisions. The Department is now proposing to amend the child cruelty offence in section 20 of the Children and Young Persons Act 68, making clear that non-physical ill treatment of a child by someone with parental responsibility for them is an offence as discussed earlier. The Department has also indicated that it will re-screen the provisions in the Bill to take account of any amendments that are accepted. The Department has also provided a list of issues that the Department intends to include in the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. Uh, these are substantial and can be found in Annex A to the Department's letter uh, dated the 23rd of September. So, members, that information is there for noting, uh, unless there is further information uh, required. Um, so, the Bill Clerk, Stephanie. Mallon has provided a text of potential amendments as instructed by the committee, and these were emailed to members and have been provided in hard copy to the meeting and in accordance with normal protocol. Uh, this session will be taking place in a closed format. So we will close the meeting. Member, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme.